All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 Cattlemen's College. The 2020 Nebraska Cattlemen Cattlemen's College. My name is Hannah Greenwell, and I will be helping us navigate through the day in, in introducing our speakers. You should, be, you should feel very honored to be a part of this first ever virtual Cattlemen's College experience. And I'll be honest, I bet you haven't had that first ever virtual honor yet this year. So we can all put that feather in our 2020 hat and be well prepared to digest the great topics presented by our high caliber lineup of speakers. Now, I would be amiss if I didn't mention the benefits of virtual programming I've come to appreciate this year, such as not having to worry about whether the convention center coffee is strong enough to get me through the afternoon or sneaking out to use the restroom and the meeting door slamming very loudly behind me. There's always still great opportunity for questions and interactions among pre presenters and participants. And lastly, Taking the cake above all those benefits is being able to help guide you through today in my dusted off blazer and comfiest pair of sweatpants. Let's quickly orient everyone with our Zoom capabilities. To the lower left hand side of your screen, you'll find the on off functions for microphone and video. I do believe Benita has disabled video throughout for right now so that we can maintain connectivity uh, throughout the whole program. At the bottom of your screen and located near center, you will find the Q&A button. We will be relying heavily on the question and answer feature today with our tech support actively monitoring the feed. Feel free to click the button and type questions, thoughts, or contributions at any time throughout the day there. Tech support will bring those to the attention of the presenters and have your questions answered. Am I gonna be able to advance my slide? There we go. Now that we have our driving controls down, Nebraska Cattlemen is a proactive organization that works through public policy to develop grassroots efforts by its members, to develop a positive business climate for members and develop continuing educational opportunities for those involved. Feel free to explore where this QR code takes you and the wealth of information about NC behind it. As a member of the 2020 Young Cattlemen's College, I've been able to witness firsthand as a group of members develops policy they believe will have a positive effect on the lives of cattle producers as well as their communities. My class will be presenting new policy to the membership during the committee meetings this week on supporting efforts to increase rural broadband accessibility. While this topic could seem to be out of the realm of Nebraska Cattlemen's influence, our lobbyists cannot act on any topic that does not have a position drafted voted on and adopted by the membership in the policy book. This minor topic is a great depiction of how our membership investment goes to only work on matters that are important to the members and, sub -sub and subsequently our operations and their longevity. I would like to thank our sponsors for today, All Flex Livestock Intelligence, Beringer Ingelheim, Ward Laboratories, Transova Genetics, and Zoetis. We will be hearing from a couple of these contributors throughout the day Thank you to these companies who believe in investing in producer education, building relationships within our industry, and providing the tools for us as cattle producers to be at our most productive. Some others that should not go unnoticed are those who put all the legwork in to make today possible. Benita Letterer, Nebraska Cattleman Director of Producer Education and Fearless Leader of our YCC program. Sydney O'Daniel, Beef Systems Extension Educator based in Webster County and covering eight counties in the southern part of the state and Brent Plugey, Beef Extension Educator based in Buffalo County and also covering Dawson and Hall counties. Thank you for all the time and effort you put in to make today such a valuable experience. Please be sure to extend your gratitude to them and they will also be serving as the head of your complaint department. In addition to Cattlemen's College, we wanna let you know of another opportunity to challenge yourself. The 2020 Beef Watch webinar series has been up and rolling since October of this year and has continued to bring timely production topics to producers right where they are. Two of our presenters today, Dr. McCarthy and Dr. Janowski, are the brains and driving force behind the webinar series and have done a great job of lining up speakers, providing applicable information and generating high merit discussion among participants. The December series topics all help get you geared up for a successful breeding season. Apologies. The first presentation of the month is occurring tonight at 8 p.m. with Dr. Casey McCarthy on bull management during winter. December 8th, Randy Saner, beef extension educator, will give a talk on pricing replacement heifers. And to round out the 2020 series, 
Dr. Matt Spangler, will be helping attendees better understand applying EPDs to projection goals on December 15th in his talk on bull selection, because bull sale season will be here before we know it. I will drop the registration link in the chat or in the web or in the Q&A box for the webinar series so that you can get registered for one or all of these topics and keep in the know on the upcoming 2021 webinar series. Taking a brief look at the layout for the day, you can see we have presentations all the way from 930 to 1145 with Dr. Molinix, Dr. McCarthy, and then hearing from Clay with All Flex Livestock Intelligence. The goal is to have time for some quick questions after each presentation. Our break will only occur from 11.45 to noon, so enough time to grab a quick something to eat and make it back. Then we'll jump right back in at noon for a couple more talks with Dr. Junowski and Dr. Cushman and Rebecca Kern with Ward Laboratories, another one of our sponsors for the day. Rounding out the day will be a panel of industry members detailing how to use carcass data to make genetic selections for a herd led by Lang Geese, who will be joined by Reese Brenning, Chip Kemp and Mark Anderson. Now, since you, all, you are all already looking down at your phones, be sure to follow Nebraska Cattlemen on Facebook to keep up with announcements and events. You can also find the UNLB Systems Extension team on Facebook at UNL Beef Extension or on Twitter at UNL Beef. This concludes all of our housekeeping for the morning and we can get into the beef of our program. Travis, if you would like to go ahead and start sharing your screen as I get through your introduction. Moving into our first topic of the day, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Travis Mullenix, who will be discussing nutritional management during breeding and calving season and managing the postpartum interval. Dr. Mullenix completed his bachelor's at Oklahoma State University in 2006 and continued his education at New Mexico State University, where he received both his master's and PhD in range nutrition under the advisory of Drs. Mark Peterson and Eric Scholagertis. During his PhD, Dr. Mullenix collaborated and conducted his PhD research at the USDA Fort Keogh Livestock and Range Research Station near Miles City, Montana where he focused on elucidating adaptive mechanisms and energy efficiency in grazing beef cows and metabolic indicators for the improvement and prediction of reproductive efficiency. After his PhD, Dr. Mullenix was hired at the University of Tennessee as an assistant professor in beef cattle nutrition. While in Knoxville, Travis served as chair for three master's students and two PhD students while making advancements in cow-calf management research. In 2017, Dr. Mullenix took an opportunity to move to North Platte, Nebraska for the role of Beef Extension Specialist in Range Nutrition at the West Central Research and Extension Center. Along with his extension and research efforts for UNL, Dr. Mullenix also serves as faculty director of Goodmanson Sandhills Laboratory, where he oversees production needs of the 12,800 acre ranch and is currently advising two master's students and two PhD students. His devotion to beef producers and strides in beef research is evident in his 54 abstracts, 50 peer-reviewed publications, 13 invited papers, and 19 extension and outreach publications. Dr. Molinix, the virtual floor is yours. Thanks, Anna, for ha having me uh, and for the intro. I'm not sure uh, I, I meet the standards that you set up before, but uh, uh, it's prestigious. But uh, today we're going to talk about a little about uh, nutritional management pre and post calving um, and uh, uh, to get prepared for the, the, the winter and uh, prepare for the breeding season next year. So I get a lot of call, uh, calls on nutritional management, uh, building rations, whether or not it's for uh, growing calves, heifers, uh, and the cow herd. And, and some things I'd like to cover uh, with those producers is understanding uh, what's those animal nutritional requirements. And that, that's a big one for to get over, uh, to, to have a good understanding, because it really controls a lot of, of how we're going to feed or what we're going to feed. Uh, they must know the stress periods that re result in nutritional deficiencies. Uh, 
And sometimes this gets people in, in big trouble of not understanding when's those high points and when those low points. And, and during those low nutritional demands, we can get by sometimes with um, not meeting some of their needs, nutritional needs, and still still having high uh, produ production. Uh, and then utilize forage as much as possible and then supplement nutritional shortages uh, from there. Um, one big one is, as we're going into a lot of guys are weeding now, especially with our summer herds, uh, but uh, monitoring nutritional status is look at body weight and body condition score. And for a lot of producers, um, th this has gotten a lot of guys in trouble of, of getting behind. And, and as we're moving forward to that late gestation time point or, or to winter when we may have some cold stress, uh, monitoring body weight and body condition scores so, and that, that change in, in the direction they're going is very important. And so some time frames that are very important to do that is uh, late summer. Late summer is, is think about September, August time frame, especially with young females, is a time to look at where are my cows at and do I need to change on my weaning date? And think about weaning date as a supplement strategy because of the influence it has on uh, nutrient requirements and, and ability of that cow to recover from lactation, put on some body weight before winter. Uh, if you think about the winter we had uh, last year, or even the year before, a lot of guys got in trouble because of their weaning dates were so late, and, and cows were in very, very thin condition due to our forage quality throughout the summer. And so if you use that late summer as a really important time frame to check where my cows are, what, what direction are we going, and do I have enough time to get those cows in a good enough condition prior to calving? Or prior to uh, winter occurring. Uh, weaning time, so a lot of guys right now are weaning calves, especially in, in summer calving herds. Uh, start a third trimester, so that really depends on what your calving season for, um, for March or spring calving herds in, in the state. We're moving into third trimester right now. Um, for our summer calving or fall calving, um, that's gonna be further on into the, uh, the winter or the spring. And then again at calving, and we'll cover some of these body condition scores uh, and then packs later on in the presentation. And so to get a, a little clearer understanding of nutrient requirements, and so for this table, we just use a 1200 pound cow that has 23 pounds of milk at peak lactation. Um, and you'll see that the two highest points of their energy requirement and protein requirements would be exactly the same in those time points is uh, about 60 days post calving is peak lactation, and that's our highest or our greatest nutrient requirement time frame. We also move right into breeding at that time frame, and that's why that's so important to understand the nutrient requirements for milk production and, and selection of milk production could have on the uh, ability of those cows to to uh, to recover from calving um, and start cycling early enough to get pregnant. And then at weaning time is our lowest point. We pull that calf off, she starts, stops lactating, and those nutrients are now be able to utilize for her body reserves to put on body weight. And then as that fetal growth occurs during late gestation time frame, we, we increase or they have an increase in requirements again. So our big, big areas to focus on some nutritional management will, will be in that early lactation time frame. Um, and preparing them, make sure they're in a positive energy balance going into that breeding season. And then late gestation, that we're maintaining a, or, or gaining body weight during that late gestation time frame, um, that we may not hurt uh, that developing fetus. Uh, just a quick overview that those two time frames, late gestation, 60, 90 days prior to calving is very important, and early lactation is somewhere between 50 to 100 days post uh, uh, calving. And, and so uh, these can change or the importance of these can change depending on your calving season. And so in a summer herd, late gestation it has less influence on your nutrition management because of timing a calving and ca calving in a higher quality forage situation than a spring or earlier um, or winter calving herd. Uh, whereas 
um, in that summer calving situation, early lactation is much a harder and um, a time frame that we may have to look at different supplementation strategies in, in, in those uh, season of calving herds versus what a spring calving. So understanding those requirements and how they fit uh, your forage supply and, and uh, uh, your feedstuffs is very important of having a very strong nutritional program. So one thing I like to focus on, if, if a supplement would change animal performance in the future, we need to feed it. And, and so if it's cost effective, it will change animal performance in the future. It, it's worth doing. And a lot of times we focus on supplementing for now. But a lot of times what we're doing is supplementing for the future. And then it's whether or not it's feeding a protein supplement right now as a insurance policy, and we'll cover that later, of maintaining body weight and, and adequate nutrients to the growth of that fetus. It could be a mineral program that, that's a insurance policy and making sure we don't have a deficiency that could have a wreck down the road. And our key, to me, the, our key performance responses that we really want to focus on is on the reproductive side. One is days to first ester. So how soon after calving do they start cycling again? And, and this is really important for uh, younger females that don't have a lot of time to recover uh, and start cycling before the start of breeding uh, to maintain that yearly calving interval. Um, and it also has to do with uh, cows that calve later that may have some difficulties of uh, rebounding and, and cycling early enough to stay in the herd. Uh, pregnancy rate and then calf weaning rate, weaning rate and weight. And, and so a lot of this has to do with fetal programming, but it also has to do with nutritional management of that cow during lactation of supplying adequate nutrients to that cow that she can support that calf. So a big deal about this is knowing your forage. And so a big question I get a lot of producers is, they want you to do a ration, but they don't know the forage. Or that we come up with, my forage is always the same, it's the same hay we've always felled every year, but every year is gonna be different. And so understanding that forage quality is very important of being very strategic about what we feed and how much we feed so we can meet those production goals. And without knowing that, we can be overfeeding or underfeeding uh, feedstuffs and not meeting your production goals. So the ultimate measure of forage quality is animal farm performance. And so think about uh, uh, summer's last couple of years that we've had uh, uh, either drought, high rainfall situations and forage qualities can be much lower. Um, last year, our forage quality, even with high rainfall, our forage quality was much lower than average. Uh, this year, in a drought situation or dry situation at Goodmanson, our forage quality is lower than average. And that's going to influence productivity and, and performance of those cows. And so, forage quality is a direct driver of performance, and understanding its role um, is very important. And, and some of that has to do with feed availability of, of not allowing them to, uh, or ha having enough feed available that they can eat all they want each given day, that we don't have a shortage. Um, and so availability intake uh, most often determine that animal performance. And so in a uh, drought condition, well, we could show you data on this in drought conditions, as long as forage, forage uh, uh, quantity is not limited, a lot of times cow performance does not change. Now we may see differences and calf weaning weight. It's when we start running into issues when we don't have enough forage available that we have a huge uh, negative response on cow performance. Uh, and so a uh, quick uh, comment about this, I talked about how forage quality changes over the years. This is uh, data from Goodmanson looking at our average forage quality in June, July, September, and October. And then we have the 2002 drought and our wet year in 2018. And the interesting thing about this is you look at a drought condition earlier on in drought, we usually have higher quality forage earlier on in a drought. It's because that forage is not growing and it stays immature longer. Um, if you look at 2018, that's a really wet year, forage quality was much lower in June than it was in the drought year and the average year. 
is because high rainfall, increased growth, and that forage matures much faster. Um, very similar forage quality in the drought in 2018, uh, in July, and uh, uh, September and October, uh, much lower forage quality during that wet year. And so understanding that interaction of how rainfall or environment is going to control our forage quality is really going to dictate the animal response. That I may, even in a wet year that we have a whole lot of rainfall, I may need to come in and change my nutritional management or how I manage those cows due to the forage quality situation um, uh, from a high or low rainfall. So a lot of times in high rainfall events or years, our forage quality really um, mimics a drought situation, but we just have increased forage supply or availability versus a, a dry year that we have limited growth. Another component is that of intake, and this got a lot of producers in trouble, especially in summer calving herds, is that um, as forage um, quality declines, cows have to eat more of that forage to be able to meet their requirements, and so there is going to be a, a time point when they can't eat enough to meet those needs because they've got fill. And so this graph just shows you uh, forage quality of 12% or, or our crew protein at 12%, 8%, and 4%, and how much they needed to eat to meet the requirements of that mid third of gestation, the last trimester, and then a cow that milks 10 pounds or 20 pounds per day. And, and so as forage quality declines, the amount of forage they have to consume to meet their requirements increases. And it gets to a point that let's say if it's a 1200 pound cow, that cow can only eat let's say 25 pounds per day on dry matter basis. Um, and so it gets situations when we get in these lower quality states that there's no, that cow has no ability to consume enough of that forage. And that's why it's very important to understand or know your forage situations in your haze. Um, last year was with the wet, cold winter that we had, a lot of guys kept saying, well, I'm feeding more hay, I'm putting out more hay, but their hay was was five, six percent crew protein. And, and putting that hay out did not uh, increase their energy intake because they couldn't eat enough of it to meet their increased nutrient requirements for cold stress. And so understanding the role of forage quality has on the ability to eat and consume to meet their requirements is important. So let's cover a little bit of late gestation management. So one, one thing to note with late gestation management, we're, we're not just feeding the cow, we're also feeding that calf, that fetus, as it's growing. And there's a lot of research from Nebraska and North Dakota and, and uh, New Mexico State and, and other uh, universities that have uh, looked at the impact of fetal programming or uh, uh, that late gestation solicitation on not only the cow performance, but that calf as well, or subsequent calf. Um, and so, you know, the big takeaway is that, remember, we're, we're, we're programming or setting up that calf for future responses, and we don't want to inhibit or hurt that calf's ability once it's born to uh, perform or maybe have a negative impact uh, on maybe a health status uh, uh, later on in its life. And so one thing to note is that, you know, uh, during late gestation, we can have a negative impact on health of that calf. And so calves that experience path or reduced passive immunity pre-calving um, due to restricted intake of, of their dams can have some uh, 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 problems with health later on. And, and, and this is just not a, a, a problem of health at birth or, or a few weeks after. This actually is a lifetime impact on their ability um, to, uh, to get over sickness or, or uh, any kind of a insult to their immune function could be decreased. And, and so this is a big concern last year with a lot of feeders in, in and out of the state of Nebraska buying Nebraska calves that after went, going through that winter of, of what's the immune function and, and status of those calves coming in the feedlot. And, and, and will we have increased sickness and death loss of those calves? 
So you know, I think about from a mature cow standpoint, uh, there there's, there's can be some times that we um, can have some body weight loss. Um, and where energy demands exceed nutrient intakes. And, and sometimes that's fine if we can plan around it and, and, and understanding the pros and cons with, with fat loss or our body weight loss because of those inner reserves on our backs are also our supplement. And if we're very strategic, we can utilize those as a energy source for that cow. So as long as we don't get too far behind the ball and have issues. Um, it's not necessarily antagonistic against reproduction, and I'll show you why later on, but we have to be very careful with that, of letting cows get too thin during late gestation and not providing the, nutrient, the nutrients after postpartum uh, to make them rebound and uh, start gaining body weight as soon as possible after calving. And so manage weight loss to manage risk. It can have a negative impact on fetal growth if extreme. Another component, of, if you think about going back into the winter situation, uh, uh, cattle energy needs for maintenance increase about 1% for each degree below 32 degrees in a dry cold. When it gets wet cold, um, that, that actually increases. It goes to starting temperature is at 59 degrees Fahrenheit instead of 32 degrees, and it's 2% uh, percent, uh, or the energy increase is 2% at that point. And so you know, I've told people I've lived in Tennessee, I've lived in Montana where it was negative 30, 40, and the coldest I've ever been is, is a negative or as a 30 degrees in Tennessee because of the wetness and, and, and you cannot get away from wet. And so wet uh, uh, increases those cold stress of those cows and it increases the requirements. And we go back to that, that slide on intake. And if we're in a wet, cold winter, feeding a low quality hay is not going to help the situation that we need to intervene with a, a more dense energy substrate like distillers um, that can offset the increase in energy requirements. Another component of that with low quality hay is a lot of producers think that I can just feed corn. Corn's an energy supplement. If I feed corn, I'll increase their energy intake. And, and to a degree that may be true in some circumstances, it also can be negative. And so this is some uh, data that uh, looked at feeding either uh, zero to or 6.6 .6 pounds per day of corn with a low quality, you know, less than a 7% crude protein hay and looked at overall energy intake. And by feeding from uh, zero to 6.6, .6, hay intake decreased decreased. And so that's just that substitution of rate of if I fed three pounds of corn, uh, they're, they're going to eat three pounds less of forage. And so there, there is that substitution that, that occurs. And what also occurs with that is uh, with 2.2 pounds of corn, we actually increased energy intake. And then a lot of that was due to a uh, very little decrease here in overall hay intake. Um, but once we start really decreasing this hay intake and feeding corn, our overall energy intake is pretty low. And so if I do not meet their protein requirements, feeding corn will have a negative impact. And, and those cows will actually be losing body weight. Uh, and, and so it kind of goes backwards to the thought process a lot of guys have is intervening with the corn. Um, and, and so that's something to, to look into. If you have a low quality hay situation, we've got to meet their protein requirements. Um, and, and distillers actually work really great in the situation that it's high energy, high protein, and it will not have the, it, the impact on forage intake like corn will, or the negative intake like corn will. So from a protein substation standpoint, our expected responses to protein substation in those low quality situations is we, go, we will increase digestibility, we'll increase forage intake. And in doing that, we actually increase energy intake. And so a lot of times feeding a protein supplement is like feeding an energy supplement due to what we do to, or what happens to um, forage intake and forage digestibility that we have an increased utilization of that hay and we overall increase energy intake uh, due to that. And that will help us maintain our increased body weight. And so this is a, a study here done in Nebraska um, 
uh, several years ago that looked at no supplement. These were steers, um, a thousand pound steers, consuming a low quality, about 5.2% crude protein, um, uh, hay. And so they had no supplement, just got the hay alone, or they got the uh, soybean meal supplement fed about, uh, I believe it was uh, about two and a half pounds of, or one, uh, 1.5 pounds of soybean meal uh, fed. If you look at the um, overall TDN intake, or TDN, yeah, TDN intake of the study, there's about a two-fold difference, or 1.3% uh, or increase in forage intake by, or energy intake by feeding a protein supplement to that low quality forage. Um, and, and so, you know, think about feeding a protein supplement as not only meeting those protein requirements, but also increasing energy utilization of that low quality forage. And so we get both double sides of increasing the energy, or the, uh, meeting the protein requirements and increasing energy intake of animals on low quality forages. Uh, a pretty similar study that was done here in Nebraska in the 1990s, early 1990s, looked at feeding air corn, air corn plus protein, or just protein alone to cows during late gestation on a low quality forage situation. Uh, and, and so what they found was that in the winter time, uh, the only one that maintained or gained body weight was protein. Uh, adding energy to that uh, actually lost body weight the energy itself lost over 100 pounds. Very similar to that energy intake slide I showed you previously that feeding just energy alone can cause them to lose more body weight because energy intake on total basis has declined. Um, and and for, at calving time, that, that group that got the protein actually lost the mo most uh, body weight. And this is really due to that cows in better condition have higher requirements. So if I got a cow in body condition source six, she has a much higher nutrient requirement than a cow that's in body condition score five or four. And so um, that goes back to the statement, we can manage body weight loss or use it as a supplement in some circumstances, as long as we allow them to rebound and, and they do have lower nutrient requirements. And that allows them, if the nutrients are there post calving, that allows them to rebound much faster um, than cows that are in better condition. And so this one concern with late gestation is over-conditioning cows, calving in too high a body condition score, and then l rapidly losing a lot of body weight during um, that early lactation time frame, and not being able to rebound like a cow that's, that's thinner, that has lower nutrient requirements. So overall this trial, the, the air corn cows lost uh, 17 pounds versus the air, uh, air corn plus protein and protein. And, and so pro protein supplementation uh, is not just protein supplementation, it's actually energy supplementation as well. And because we're increasing the utilization of that low quality forage. Um, this is some older data from uh, Goodmanson that looked at feeding a protein supplement via distiller grain, 32% through protein supplement um, during late gestation to March calving cows or we've got cows that uh, had uh, a no supplement versus getting a pound per day of that 32% supplement. Uh, and, and this is why I talk about it being an insurance policy is that um, it, it helps maintain that body weight to those cows during that late gestation timeframe versus no supplement or a calving timeframe. There's nearly a, uh, a little bit less than a full body condition score difference between getting a protein supplement at one pound versus nothing. Um, but when we look at pregnancy rates in these two groups, pregnancy rates and, and these mature cows are exactly the same. And the reason behind that is this rebound period here. Uh, these cows without supplement during late gestation rebounded because the nutrients were there to help them recover from being a little thin, having lower nutrient requirements at calving versus their counterparts. Um, and so the, the problem people run into in these circumstances is not having the nutrients there during this time frame and not allowing that rapid body weight gain going into that breeding season or through that breeding season um, to, to get those cows pregnant. And, and so um, that's why feeding this protein supplement is an insurance policy, not only on maintaining body weight body condition score during late gestation, 
we have less risk of how we have to manage those cows uh, after calving. And so think about if we have later green ups or, or in a drought situation the following year, there's a lot of risks that we take when we run cows to them. And so we have to be ahead of the game and not let them get too far behind that if we run to the cir circumstances, we need to have a game plan and be very quickly, uh, very quick with how we change our nutritional management. If not, we will not see a pregnancy rate uh, that's similar to these with having uh, thinner cows. This is 15 years of uh, late gestation work that was done here at Goodmanson. Uh, on um, uh, this is looking at just the heifer progeny end of it, of feeding no supplement during late gestation, one pound per day, two pound per day of a 32% group protein supplement, um, uh, roughly 90 days uh, prior to calving. And the real only takeaway from the heifer side of this is there's a slight increase in and half our body weights at weaning by feeding a protein supplement. So that one pound um, did have some kind of a fetal programming impact on calf weaning weight versus no supplement. But post weaning time frame, there was actually no difference in performance cow body weights. So heifers from the no supplement groups caught up to be exactly the same as their counterparts getting a protein supplement. Um, from the steer progeny safe side, same thing. Um, uh, feed a protein supplement, we'll see a slight increase in calf weaning weight uh, versus the counterparts that are getting no supplement uh, during late gestation. Um, uh, post weaning in the feedlot, uh, from a body weight standpoint, so their live weight, hot carcass weight, very similar across the board. We did see a, a slight increase in and marbling score by feeding a protein supplement over their counterparts. And, and so, you know, that, that protein supplement not only is that insurance policy for maintaining body, body weight and body conditions for those cows, but it also helps with those calves, uh, providing the right nutrients for that calf that could increase its subsequent uh, performance later on in its life. The other thing we need to talk about is type of protein. And so, um, we've got a couple different types of protein. It's uh, rumen degradable protein and rumen undegradable protein. And so a lot of our uh, protein types like alfalfa, hay, soybean meal, um, cottonseed meal, uh, th those are really high in rumen degradable protein. Uh, uh, distiller grains, a lot of our animal byproducts, fish meal, feather meal, blood meal, or porcine blood meal, um, corn gluten meal, are high in rumen undegradable protein source. And the difference is that rumen degradable protein is degraded by the rumen microbes and they repackage that protein to totally different uh, uh, the protein or amino acid structure than what was fed. And so they control the, the amino acids that get to the cow uh, for, for the cow to be utilized. And so with rumen undegradable protein sources that the cow actually gets a larger portion of the amino acids that were fed in, in those supplements. And, and what we find is, and, um, from a cow aspect, that feeding a rumen undergradable protein source, that's, or high in rumen undergradable protein, um, helps with high stressful times, whether or not it's late gestation or during the breeding season. And um, that uh, high rumen undergradable protein, and, and it has a huge impact on performance. And a lot of our forage, especially during the breeding season, are actually high in rumen degradable protein and were deficient in rumen undegradable protein during the breeding season in both uh, uh, spring calving or summer calving herd. But in this study, it was done in Montana here, that in year one, it was a really mild open winter, and year two was a harsh closed winter, uh, really wet, had a lot of snow, and they, they had three different supplements were fed. One was a snow supplement, uh, the second was one pound of rumen degradable protein, uh, so similar to a cottonseed meal, alfalfa hay type. And then the third supplement was one pound of a high rumen undergradable protein source, uh, similar to a distiller's grain. And what they found is during that, that mild winter, uh, very similar body weight gains between the rumen degradable and the rumen undergradable protein sources, but it was during that harsh winter. 
the cows that were fed, that rumen unintegratable protein source actually maintained body weight, where rumen unintegratable uh, uh, cows lost more body weight. And so um, type of protein really influences, or can influence uh, productivity of the cows. And so that needs to be taken into account when we think about supplementation strategies uh, during those key time points of late gestation and early lactation. This is a uh, study done here in Nebraska. This is some Trey Patterson's PhD research, but they looked at feeding a uh, RUP supplement um, during late gestation to March calving heifers. And so this is a, a, another one of those examples when I said if it has a uh, impact later on a future impact, uh, it's worth feeding. And so feeding this bypass or the improvement integratable protein source in this study actually increased pregnancy rates, following pregnancy rates of those March calf and first calf heifers versus a, a rumen degradable protein source. And so, you know, that's over a hundred days after um, they were they fed the supplement, they saw a pregnancy rate difference by feeding uh, rumen integratable protein sources. And, and so, um, so that's a really important thing about, you know, what I'm doing now could have a future impact, not only on that calf side, but also can influence uh, future pregnancy rates of those cows. A, a very similar study uh, in terms of, of the type of protein and, and very similar to some of the other studies we talked about. This was some uh, work of mine was at New Mexico State that fed uh, uh, in late gestation to mature cows, either two pounds per day of cottonseed meal supplement, which is a high rumen degradable protein source, a quarter pound per day of a rumen undegradable uh, protein supplement, or no supplement all to mature cows in late gestation, that quarter pound per day of a high bypass actually uh, maintained body weight. It's very similar to feeding two pounds per day of a rumen degradable uh, cottonseed milk supplement. Um, we saw that difference in calving body condition score, about a half a difference between them and the no supplement group, and the pregnancy rates were, were equal across the board. But the real big impact was off the uh, steer performance side, and not so much from a body weight side, because we found no difference in steer body weight in the feedlot, but what we found was uh, sickness that feeding a rumen unintegratable protein source influenced um, uh, uh, immune function of those calves uh, uh, in the feedlot. And so this hyperprotein source not only can have a future impact on pregnancy rates, it may have an impact on the ability of those calves to, to adapt to a, a insult or a high stress time point later on. And so um, that's another avenue we need to look at when we think about supplementation strategies that not all proteins are created equal. So let's quickly move to uh, management after calving. So when you think about the cow herd, um, uh, gestation is about 280 days. And so we need cows to recover and start uh, breeding or get pregnant within 90 days of that to maintain a calving interval. Some of the issue with that is um, with two and three year old cows, they, they typically are um, cycling again after calving somewhere around 80 to 100 days. And so that makes, well, it's one reason why they have lower preg rates than their counterparts or older cows in the herd is that uh, they have a very tough time of recovering and start recycling after calving because of they're, they're still growing, they're lactating for the first or second time. And so that there's, that's a big challenging age group for those cows to um, re recover from that and still trying to learn to be a cow. And so from a nutritional standpoint, one thing I like to do is I want cows to be gaining weight prior to breeding. And, and so the sooner the better I can get cows to hit what was called body weight made there. It's time point from losing body weight to gaining body weight. I can get them cycling pretty quick. And so in dairy industry, the, they typically think about within a week after hitting body weight made there, um, the uh, dairy cows will cycle. And it's pretty similar with beef cows. Once I hit that time point when 
they stop losing body weight and start gaining body weight, um, it, it has a huge impact on when they're cycling again. And so um, uh, getting cows gaining body weight is, is very important post calving. So one thing is it can be economically challenging to increase body weight during lactation. And a lot of this is due to how cows prioritize nutrients. And so uh, they will prioritize nutrients to lactation and supporting lactation before they will prioritize it to uh, reproduction, before they prioritize it to body weight gain or body weight uh, uh, or I guess maintenance. Uh, and, and so it's, that's a very important to think about is if I'm selecting for cows that have higher milk, I'm making it even harder on myself in, in certain environments for those cows to be able to uh, to lactate and support lactation, but also to recover from calving and lactation um, to gain body weight and get pregnant in a timely manner. And, and so, um, so it can be very challenging to get thin cows pregnant depending on the type of forage and quality of forage that we have. And so this is just an illustration of the impact that increased milk production has on uh, nutrient demands. As, as weak of, uh, lactation uh, increases, we, we find that peak lactation occurs about eight weeks. And so somewhere about 58, 60 days postpartum. And as we, if we select for in increase in milk production in our herd, then we increase those requirements in a time frame that you know, our driver of, of profit and profitability is, is not necessarily calf weaning weight, which only has a lot of databases, has only about 5% influence on profitability, but we're, we're selecting for something that could be driving us away from reproductive efficiency. And, and so that's very important to consider in your genetic selection is what kind of cows really fit my environment and am I selecting for something that has too much milk in, uh, in the environment that I'm trying to manage in. So this is just a quick illustration of, of how uh, ruminants will prioritize nutrients. I briefly talked about this, but, but um, um, you know, the first place they'll uh, prioritize nutrients is body maintenance. And that's just to maintain body function. The next place is reproduction. It is not to get pregnant. This is actually to maintain a pregnancy. And so think about late gestation or mid gestation that we're trying to maintain um, being pregnant. Um, the, the next place if, if will be lactation. And so, you know, during post calving, you know, the lactation has a huge driver of nutrient use and, and it's, it's the one of the first places those nutrients will go to rather than go to um, trying to get that cow pregnant or, or, or adding body weight. And, and finally, it'll go to preg pregnancy establishment and getting uh, recycling after calving and, and, and increased body weight or increased body weight gain or increasing that storage. And, and so that's why it's really important to think about uh, the level of milk production I have and where I'm going with milk production within my calving season. Um, I talked about this earlier, but this is the, the problem with younger cows and why we have lower pregnancy rates or can see lower pregnancy rates in young cows is, is postpartum intervals. So that's the time frame from calving until they're cycling and get after calving. And, and so you think about to maintain that, that 365 day calving interval, I've got to get cows bred before day 90. And this is some older data from Wolf Bake from 1970, but it's it holds fairly true of, uh, I've got data from New Mexico, I've got data from here in, in Nebraska that our two-year-olds are cycling somewhere about 90, 95 days post-calving, especially in our May calving herds. And, and, and that makes it very tough to have high pregnancy rates. It makes it very tough for them, even if they did get pregnant, uh, they're calving later as a three-year-old. It makes it tough for a three-year-old to recover in time if they calf late in that breeding season to get pregnant again. And so those later calving younger females 
tend to fall out very quickly because of the timing of when they calved uh, in, in relation to when that breeding season occurred. And for mature cows getting four or five, six up, you know, we really don't see a big issue with postpartum interval as a big controller of reproduction in, in cows. A uh, postpartum interval in the two and three rate is the driver of reproductive efficiency. And so how can I get that day to decrease? How can I get cows to cycle earlier and get pregnant earlier? It is really a key um, to um, uh, increasing pregnancy rates in cows. And, and some of that has to do with body weight gain. So this is some data from a group out of Georgia from 1995 that looked at postpartum rate of gain and reproduction. And so this is the um, first 20 days of breeding, the first 40 days, and by day 60 of the breeding season. And they had in the blue bar is gaining one pound per day, and the, and the red bar is gaining two pounds per day. And the really what's, what's driving this pregnancy rate of success is this early on in the first 20 days. And so gaining one pound per day, they're about a 30% pregnancy rate success. Um, with two pounds per day, jumped up to 50%. And so not nearly doubled, but that uh, uh, the impact on average daily gain or the body weight gain has a big impact on timing of pregnancy. So the sooner I can get those cows gaining body weight, the better off I am of, of getting them pregnant sooner. And sometimes this makes it easier for a thin cow to gain body weight if the nutrient um, quality is high enough that I'm not limiting nutrient intake uh, to get them pregnant because of the amount of body weight gain they're gaining. Think about that slide I showed you with no protein supplement and a protein supplement during late gestation of the difference in body condition score at calving, but having no difference in pregnancy rates. And it really that was driven by that rate of gain postpartum. And so this is um, a, some older data of uh, Wilt Banks as well that looked at prepartum nutrition and postpartum nutrition interaction. And so from a prepartum standpoint, they had lower maintenance levels. So meeting body maintenance, so scouts did gain body weight, they maintained their body weight, or a low nutrition level, they lost body weight during late gestation. And then they uh, did that in a factorialized, so they had a low, low group, a low prepartum and a low postpartum nutrition, and they looked at postpartum interval of those mature cows was 73 days. They went from low to a high postpartum nutrition level, and postpartum interval was 54 days. So decreased postpartum interval by nearly 20 days, that's almost one cycle. And so that's very important in thinking of uh, getting cows pregnant earlier. And so I can calve thin cows as long as my postpartum nutrition level is adequate or it's high. If it's not there, that's when I start running in trouble of this low, low group or um, sometimes if I have cows in too good of a condition at calving and they're in low postpartum uh, nutrition, then I see a big negative impact because they have an increase in body weight loss. Uh, this maintenance low group was 68, the maintenance high group was 66. Uh, and so the reason why postpartum interval was less here with the low high was that rate of gain. They're thinner, they have more rapid rate of gain after calving. And so they start cycling much sooner because that rate of gain, going back to the previous slide of one pound versus two pound rate of gain um, during that breeding season. This is uh, some uh, traditional or, or normally what you see with, with the, any talk about calving body condition score, it impact of body condition score on reproduction. And so this is a very standard or, or uh, a slide that uh, people use a lot, use a lot or use this data a lot is uh, mature cows in body condition score four had a pregnancy rate of 60, uh, five had 78%, and body condition score six had 91%. And, and this is what were the data really pushing the cows need to be in body condition score six at calving to increase pregnancy rates. And the reason why in, in these data this is, could be occurring is 
this next uh, graph here is percent cycling within 80 days of cavity. And so if they were body condition score four or less, only 62% were cycling at body condition score five or 88 and six, nearly 100% of those cows were cycling. And, and so the, the, the key here is those cows were cycling or, or the time frame of, of recovering from calving and, and cycling early enough to get pregnant, which is really driving some of this data with body condition score. Um, and so if you go back to that previous slide of, of, of rate of gain, I can still get those thin cows pregnant as long as their rate of gain is high. Another avenue to really look at is, is ionophores. Um, and, and so ionophores, whether or not it's Bovitec or Tremensin, can have a, a big impact on post frontal interval. Um, so it's a nice feed additive that has a, a really good po uh, reproductive response. And so this is five different studies with um, different ionophores, Bovitec or Remensin, on uh, looking at postpartum postpartum interval in, in cows. And so our control without any uh, uh, ionophore versus the red that has the ionophore. And across those five different studies, postpartum interval decreased. On average, and a lot of this is driven by this one study, had a larger uh, decrease, but on average, it was about 18 days shorter postpartum interval by adding a, a small amount of a feed additive that can have a reproductive response. And so um, if I was uh, building supplements for someone, I always put Remensin or Bovitec in their supplementation strategies. And it's due to the, the response we get out of these ionophores are much higher than the cost of Phytomed. So they're very cost effective that can have a big impact on performance. So another avenue is, and this is some of my uh, master's work, it is a product that's a propionate salt. Um, it's the product uh, that they use in dairy industries for ketotic cows at calving. So they'll, they'll give them a large bolus or a large dose of these uh, propionate salts. And what it is, is it increases the uh, glucose supply to that cow. So with fermentation in the rumen, um, the, the cow only gets about less than 5% of its glucose coming from their diet. And so a cow versus us has to make their own glucose, where we make our glucose from our diet or comes from our diet. And, and so a lot of times glucose is a shortage. And, and, and the need for glucose is really what's driving a lot of these responses due to how um, beef cows utilize glucose for milk production. And, and there's a huge increase in demand for glucose for, for milk production. And there tends to be a shortage of glucose for actually cows for their metabolic use. And so in this study with two and three year old cows of feeding 40 grams per day of this propionate salt, uh, this is postpartum interval, well, got cut off here, but this is postpartum interval with two and three year olds that feeding 40 grams of propionate salts with a bypass protein supplement, we decreased uh, days to uh, 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 resumption of estrus by six days. And so six days is, is, doesn't seem like a big time frame, but roughly a week that it gave those cows increased chance to get pregnant. But our big response is here in the pregnancy rates. By adding 40 grams of a, of a uh, feed additive to that protein supplement, we increased pregnancy rates by uh, 11 to, or 7 to 11 percent. Um, getting the same amount of protein is just one, it's different type of protein and adding something that has a, could have a big uh, uh, metabolic response that influences reproduction. Very similar to what Remensen will do or, or Bovitec will do in terms of increasing uh, the glucose supply post removal to a cow. So briefly, it's, I want to touch on body condition scoring beef cows. And so this is a very um, important topic right now as we talk about, you know, weaning and nutritional management of cows going through winter and, and preparing them for calving um, to make sure we're in a good condition for, for calving. 
And so what we already talked about this slide of, of, of the key requirements uh, of uh, what, what our highest nutrient requirements are and, and monitoring nutrient status. But we think of body condition score, uh, it's an indicator of stored reserves. So, uh, you know, a lot of times we get stuck on, or a lot of think, you know, body condition scoring is just fat. Uh, but it's also fat and protein tissue. And that's very important because I can manage cows very effectively losing body weight as long as they're not losing protein tissue. If they're losing protein tissue, then I can run into a lot of issues um, because the first place that they'll start mobilizing protein tissue is organs. And once organ mass decreases, especially liver, then their ability to function during like early lactation De declines. Um, and, and that's when we start seeing some metabolic challenges and some dis dysfunctions that they can have. Um, but body condition scoring is not only fat, it's both we're looking at fat and protein tissue. So why is it important? One, it's there's a close relationship between body condition score at calving in the first 90 days after calving to reproductive success and calf immune system. And I'll show you some data on that as well. But uh, the current body condition score is a result of one, the balance between the nutrient uh, supply and the recent nutrient requirements. And so one thing we need to do with body condition score is look at where we're at now, where we're headed. So let's, that's when we start thinking about what's my forage supply, what's my forage quality, or what am I feeding? And where am I headed? You know, right now we're heading in late gestation in spring calving cows. What's, you know, what's my forage supply is gonna be uh, maybe pretty low quality forages. And so understanding that, understanding my role of, do I need it to change my supplementation strategy to increase body weight of those cows or body conditions for those cows to prepare them for the winter and, and for calving. It's also a result of management, of the grazing management, supplementation program. Uh, and timing and calving, all that plays a role in current body condition score. It also can be a mismatch of genetic potential to forage and management systems. So a question I get a lot is, why are my cows thinner over the years? Each year they get thinner. Each year my pregnancy rates decline, and we start talking about bull selection, and they're selecting for cows or through genetic selection, they're selecting for genetics that don't fit their environment. And so whether or not their cows are getting too big or they're selecting for more and more milk, um, there is a mismatch in that genetic potential. So nutrient requirements are increasing, but our forage supply is staying the same. And so there has to be a change in, if I'm selecting for that, there has to be a change in forage management system to be able to sustain those increased in nutrient requirements. So some key areas to evaluate, these are some nice pictures that was taken from uh, Oklahoma State in one of their programs, but um, oh. it's not popping up. All right, we'll just talk about it. So key areas is one, this top line area. And so we've got two cows in completely different um, body condition scores, you know, think about this top cow is, is pretty round. Uh, she's pretty flat backed um, uh, compared to this, this cow in this bottom that's extremely thin. She's very uh, pitched, uh, very, um, very thrifty looking, longer hair. Um, and so uh, one big area is, is this top line area. So you can tell a big difference in, in body condition scores of these cow, two cows <laughs> versus their top line. Ribs are another one. You can see this picture is a little dark, but I can see at least three ribs showing this cow and no ribs showing in this cow. Uh, another is this tail head area uh, between hooks of pins and that tail head. You know, cows as they gain body condition score, to increase body condition score, they'll increase fat deposits on that tail head. Uh, another is down here in this, uh, uh, below the, the tail head is you can see how, how this is dished out and this cow wouldn't be dished out. And that's, that's, that's actually protein reserves are being lost here versus here. And so the, those are the key areas to really look at body condition score in cows. Well, the problem is, and this cow kind of illustrates a little bit of that is, 
is it can be deceiving. And so hair coat can make you over or underestimate body conditions for it. Um, and so you've got to be able to see through that hair coat. And the best way to do that is body condition score cows when they come through the chute and put your hand on them. And get your hand or your eye adjusted to body condition scoring cows. Um, because you can be highly inaccurate body condition scoring cows out in pasture if you're not um, continually body condition scoring cows with your hand as they go through the chute. Uh, and, and so even trained uh, technicians of body condition scoring gears can be off in a pasture if they're not continually body condition scoring in, in the chute. Um, gut feel can influence what you think of a body condition score. So if I got them on a, on a full hay ration and they come in with this huge gut feel, then you may think they're in better condition than, than previously. A, a storm can come through and if you body condition score after a storm where they have not consumed or, or drank anything, then they're going to look shrunk up and you're well, under body condition score. I'm thinking they're thinner than they are. And so after storms, I would wait a day or two, to let them uh, get back on water, get back on feed uh, before you score cows. Uh, and, and so th those can make you um, inaccurately uh, estimate what body conditions for those cows are. So we really won't go through this, but there, there's, there's a body condition score that we use is one to nine system. Is one be emaciated, a nine be obese. Um, and, and so from a lot of our production systems, it's very, uh, unless you're highly mismanaging cows, it's hard to get below a three. Um, and, and, and it's hard for, in our nutritional program, especially for our grazing side, it's hard to get over a seven. And so I've probably body condition score most, 75% of my cows in a five or less in my career. Um, and, and so very few uh, above a six. Uh, uh, and, and so we're, we're, you generally see somewhere between a three to six. Um, but really when you think about body condition score, don't think about these numbers, but think about cows being thin, being in good condition, being fat. And so make it simple in your management of where cows are um, and instead of being stuck on a scoring system. Uh, and, and so knowing that, you know, that cow is showing more rib or more uh, um, uh, vertebrae, that, that cow is probably less than a five and she's in a thin condition. Or, or she has good cover across her ribs and good cover across her top line. She's at least a five and, and if she's rounded off, she's probably a six or greater. And so understanding, you know, make it simple that, that cows in thin, good, or, or, or more fleshy fat condition uh, is it, much easier than using that one to nine system. The one thing to note is um, to move up or down, and, and we estimate that's about 70, 80 pounds. Uh, so if I get cows in body condition score four, they need to gain 70, 80 pounds to get to a five. And, and so, so a body condition score change, you know, think about, you know, the cow has to gain 70, 80 pounds or lose 70, 80 pounds to get to the one below or above it. And, and so if, if I have cows that are fours right now, I want them to be in fives, then they need to gain nearly 100 pounds to get up to that five that I want them in. And, and so that's important in understanding my nutritional management of I need to gain body weight and how much body weight I need to gain. So this is some uh, pictures that Rick Rasby, I think he's on here, uh, took of one cow and four or three different body conditions for it. And what makes this really nice is it's the same cow. Because each cow it will, will put on or take on body weight or, or protein and body conditions for differently at different places. And so some cows lose more of the ribs than they will up at their top line. And some cows lose a lot more on the top line and very little at their ribs. And, and, and so that's one reason why we can't body condition score cows just looking at their top line or just looking at their ribs. We have to take into account the entire cow and, 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 and use that as the estimate versus one or the other. And so, um, so so these are in the slides, I'm sure you have them, but this gives you a good estimate of what a four, five, and six will look like in, in our settings that 
The difference in the top line has three ribs showing, has two ribs showing in a five, um, a really smoothed out top line, and then um, a much rounder stance in a body condition score six uh, of, of this cow in the bottom picture. So one, eyes need to be calibrated with palpating. It's hard to body condition score cows with your eyes unless you're continually doing it with your hands. Um, so I've, I've briefly talked about this, but we can call cows and body, a better body condition score than they actually are by their hair coat, gut fill, and then we can call them worse due to um, after a winter store that they have uh, shrunk up. Um, but the really key is we need to calibrate our eyes with our hands. If getting your hands on cows throughout the year when they're coming through the shoots to calibrate to what body condition score is. Uh, and so what if cows are thin at weaning? And, and so one, you know, the weaning to 90 days prior to calving it as a window is one of our better windows actually to increase body weight and body condition score of those cows. Um, you know, once we take that calf off, um, we will decrease nutrient requirements. We also save a lot of forage. If I take that, if I wean and take that calf off, the, off, off of that pasture, I save about 10 pounds of forage. Uh, due to that calf not eating and uh, decrease in requirements in forage intake of that cow during life, uh, from lactation. 90 days of calving was our last chance to economically increase body condition score. And so we are increasing nutrient requirements and that's driven by fetal growth. We also get start running into issues with cold stress, with wet, with, with, with storms that, that can that can uh, decrease our ability to actually put on body condition score that can set us back. And that's why that weaning to 90 days of knowing, looking at that late summer of, of when should I wean, it is very important that if I have really thin cows, I should wean earlier to give them more time to recover. Uh, I talked about this earlier, but or a similar study to this earlier, but this is a study done at Good Goodmanson that wean cows either in September or, or uh, uh, in first of November. And, and so what that did is that once I took that calf off, weaned them, decreased lactation, um, those requirements now decrease and, and those nutrients now can go to body weight maintenance. And so at calving time, um, if you look at our early versus late, at calving time in March, there's nearly a full body condition score difference by timing the weaning. And that's why I, I said earlier that use weaning data as a supplementation strategy. Um, so it's a very cost-effective supplementation strategy. And, and there's other avenues if cows are thin that we, we could come in with a distiller's grain supplementation during that September, October time frame to help put condition score on those cows. Um, if forage supply is limited, we may not want to do that because we could increase forage intake. And, um, and so in, in dry years, we need to look at something that's more starch based to decrease or, or a supplementation strategy that would decrease forage intake. Um, but uh, weaning day can it be a big influence on, on the cow's ability to put on body condition score prior to calving. Uh, similar to that, but protein supplementation study I talked about, no difference in pregnancy rates and really was driven by this right here, is that rebound period is uh, allowing those cows to be in high enough nutrient intake to rebound being thin. This is some older data from uh, uh, Miles City, Montana to USDA station of Bob Shorts, but looked at average weaning date supplement supplement effects on body condition score of cows from September, to December. And so if we compare dry cows versus lactating cows from September, October, so they weaned a set of cows in September and looked at the body condition score change in December from that time point in September by weaning here, about a three tenths increase in body condition score in dry and about a seven, a seven tenths decrease in body condition score. So basically a full body condition score difference by weaning those calves in September versus December. And so that calf was really sucking down that cow and she's using her body reserves 
um, to increase or, or to maintain lactation. In the no supplement, to the supplement studies, uh, no supplement during that time frame, cows lost about 0.6 uh, body condition scores. With a protein supplement, uh, cows gained about 0.2. So very similar, almost a full body condition score with that protein supplement coming in September versus um, no supplement. And, and so a very similar response of weaning and supplement. And, and so we, we can look at this two different ways. One, weaning is a supplement, or we can come in with a supplement, supplement strategy, even during like lactating cows to, to increase body condition score of those cows. Um, so it gives us a couple different options in those scenarios that we have thin cows. So one consideration is sort thin and young cows, these two and three year old or, or thin cows from your cow herd um, and manage them differently. So if I've got an average body condition score of five in my herd, I'm gonna have some fours. I may have some threes in there. Also we'll have some sixes. And so if I was wanna be strategic and and to control my supplementation cost, I'm not gonna feed them all the same. Uh, I'd sort off those thin or young cows to feed them a higher quality uh, feedstuff supplementation strategy, and I can feed the cows and get condition something less, something lower quality, um, and, and can really control my uh, supplementation cost. Um, another thing I, and I see a lot of guys doing is managing their twos and threes with their mature cows. And if I manage them separately, I can actually have a bump in reproductive performance. And so they don't have to compete with a mature cow. And when they're competing with mature cows, you see their performance decreasing. Um, and, and so, uh, so that's a early important if you can do it. A lot of smaller producers, it makes it tough due to resources to manage them differently. But if you can manage those younger females to, uh, separately versus with mature cows, you'll see a performance increase in those cows. So if we think about uh, body condition score influences on calf health, and we talked about this, this is some older data, Ken Oldies from 1997, that shows them body condition score of cows at calving from two to six on concentration of IgGs and uh, uh, of the serum at 24 hours old of that calf. And Really, the takeaway is once cows get in this two to three range, we start seeing a big drop in IgG status of those calves. And, and so there is a linear increase in IgG um, status as body condition score goes up. And this is really just directly related to nutrient input. Uh, those cows in a body condition score five or six had higher nutrient intake than cows in that two to three range. And, and so so body conditions for can have an influence on calf health uh, due to the, those transfer of nutrients during late gestation. And we talked about this in the previous slides. Of, this was some older data or some data of mine from New Mexico that with two and three year olds looked at the influence of body conditions for calving on pregnancy rates. Um, and, and so We've looked at resumption of estrus at that time point from calving to cycling again. Um, we find no difference in, in that days to resumption of estrus uh, for my four body conditions for four, five, and six. And we find no difference in pregnancy rates from that four, five, and six. And really the key here is our, nutrition, our neutral input uh, postpartum was high enough in those fours to allow them to rebound and get pregnant. If I limit that postpartum, that's when I start having trouble with body condition scores um, being low in influence in reproduction. And these cows that are say in four, there's a high percentage of these cows that are three and a half to three in, in this four range. Um, but it, it's really that nutritional inputs, that nutrient intake postpartum that's really controlling that. And a good illustration of this, this is some, some data of Will Banks from, uh, from back in 1962 that looked at body conditions for prior to calving of cows that are in 6.5 versus 4.4 and body conditions for 90 days after calving of 5.1, 5.2. So uh, difference, uh, about two body conditions were difference at uh, prior to calving 
uh, 90 days later, they were exactly the same. And what they did was they changed the energy intake of those two groups, having the cows in a greater body condition score losing body weight, having the thin cows gain body weight. We look at pregnancy rates, there's only almost a 20% increase or per percentage point increase in pregnancy rates. That's really driven by body weight change. I, it's much easier to get cows pregnant, gaining body weight than getting cows pregnant, losing body weight. And so it really does not matter what their calving body condition score is, as long as they're gaining body weight. If I have cows losing body weight, it doesn't matter what our body condition score is, I'm gonna have some issues. And so the energy intake is really influencing their ability to get pregnant. And so if I limit this, I will have negative impacts. So cows in a body condition score cows or four at calving will breed well if not challenged. Um, and, and so really have to know your system, know, know your management, and know the risk of that. Because if I have cows in a body condition score four at calving and I come in with a drought, I've got to be very proactive in my nutritional supply to make sure those cows are gaining body weight um, after calving to get them pregnant. Um, I told someone this the other day that um, a long time ago when Don Clapton was the nutritionist here, they had cows coming in a body condition score one from the ag lab. And after a bad winter, the, those cows are extremely thin. They put them in dry lot, fed a corn silage diet and nearly had it. 100% pregnancy rate in those cows. That was in a body condition score one. And, and so uh, knowing your system and, and knowing um, where those cows are at and, and what kind of feedstuffs you have available can work for you instead of uh, working against you. Uh, we earlier if cows are thinner. Um, there's other options of if supplementation can come in uh, and, and add a supplementation strategy uh, additional energy may be needed for thin cows. Remember, protein supplementation uh, is an energy supplementation as well with low quality forage. And then cold and wet winter increases energy requirements. So when it's cold and when it's wet, their requirements are going to increase. And so their hay quality may limit intake to actually meet those requirements. And so we need to come in, especially if it's a longer period of just one or two nights, Gonna to have to come in with a different strategy to maintain body weight to those cows. If you're continually playing catch up to improve body condition score prior to calving, something is wrong. Either your genetics are off, your management is not there, uh, your timing of calving is off. And so, um, and it could be a combination of all of them. And so look at your body condition score. If you're having issues with having thin cows year in, year out, and you're having poor breed backs or pregnancy rates, then something in your management system could be off that needs to be tweaked or changed um, to get those cows in a better body condition score and, and performance. So with that, uh, I'll gladly take any questions and turn it back over to Hannah. Perfect. Thank you, Travis. Um, I'm going to touch on a couple quick questions just because I'm MC, so I'm biased and I get to pick the questions I like, right? Um, so one question we had in the chat or in the Q&A, how are propionate salts delivered to cows in a range setting? Yeah, so uh, th those propionate salts are, they're actually uh, put in your supplements. And so uh, it's just 40 grams that were added to a supplement, just like adding a mineral to a supplement. Uh, and so these are in cubes, um, but you, you could add that uh, to even a loose, you know, tried distiller grain and, and mix it at that given rate like you would rimensin. Um, and so very similar uh, as you would add any feed additive to a, a cake or a cube uh, or, or a uh, meal type. Perfect. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to do one more live question, and then I'll have you go to the Q&A and pick out some answers. Um, a challenge for producers is to determine daily intake, not only to help balance rations, but also for planning purposes. What are some good rules of thumb to kind of estimate that daily intake for those cows? Yeah, from a dry matter base, I, I would just go off of, uh, let's just say it's 2%. Let's make it simple of, of a 2% of, of 
that cow's body weight or she'll consume 2% of her, her body weight on a dry matter basis. Um, now with lower quality forage, that could be 1.7, 1.8. Uh, you know, go back to a slide where I showed that low quality forages, we, we have more issues with ability to eat to meet the requirements. Um, but I, I would use with low quality forage, you could use 1.8% of their body weight. Uh, during lactation, that increases because their requirements increase and you're probably about 2.2% of the body weight. Uh, but those on a, on a percent, on a dry matter basis. And so we've got to take that water out of that feed stuff uh, and so, um, you know, with like a corn silage type diet, you know, we could be feeding 80, 90 pounds on a wet basis. And so for a lot of producers, that seems like a huge amount, but when it's 70% 70, 70 water or 67% water, you know, we've got to take that water out to put it on an equal basis versus, you know, a hay that's maybe 88% dry matter. Um, and so I, I would use those as my markers as, as, as a low quality, I'd get 1.8 for a lactating cow, uh, 2.2, and then um, with, with a dry cow with a decent forage, you're probably about 2% 2, 2 to their body weight. Perfect. Travis, I'm going to direct you to the Q&A box to type out some answers for some follow-up questions, if you don't mind. Yep. Um, and thank you so much for your presentation today. Thank you. All right, we're gonna keep this rolling. And I want to make sure to mention that you're able to follow along with our presenter slides and the attachment that came out to your inbox this morning. Benita sent it out first thing this morning. So if you find that in your email, the attachment's there just to make sure everyone's aware that they do have access to these slides if they'd like to follow along and pick up on some of the data points that might've been skimmed over. So up next, we have Dr. McCarthy presenting on long-term benefits and economics of estro synchronization following protocols, mistake recovery and troubleshooting, and plus tools available. Dr. Casey McCarthy is the beef cow-calf specialist in the animal science department at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where she began working in January of 2020. I'd like to invite Casey to go ahead and share her slides now. Her role in the department includes teaching the beef cow-calf management and livestock management on range and pasture courses, and is interested in research and extension programs related to reproduction and nutrition interactions. She is currently involved with extension and research programs looking at heifer and bull supplementation and development strategies, as well as cow-calf health and confinement. McCarthy received her bachelor's in animal science from Colorado State University while competing as a D1 athlete playing softball. During her master's program at New Mexico State University, she worked with Dr. Eric Skuljertis, Skuljertis, sorry, to evaluate the effects of early implantation with Ralgro on performance and profit margin of Holstein steer calves. During her PhD program with Dr. Carl Dolan at North Dakota State University, McCarthy's research work evaluated mineral and energy supplementation strategies for grazing beef cattle. Casey, it's all yours. Hannah, thank you and welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to be on this morning. Uh, <clears throat> I tried to condense that title. I know it's pretty wordy. Uh, and so hopefully we can talk about some different tips for successful synchronization programs, maybe get everyone thinking about um, maybe utilizing some of these programs uh, with their operation. And so see if we can get these slides to advance. So ultimately the, the outline here today is uh, the title that Hannah uh, gave. So looking at some of these long-term benefits for our estro synchronization programs, what are some tools that are available? And we can walk through some of those uh, that are available online and, and how we might be able to, to utilize some of those tools uh, in your next breeding season. Uh, and then look at some of those costs associated with some different programs, uh, thinking about how we can use pro protocols uh, depending on the stage of uh, postpartum or maybe a different class or group of animals. So, Ultimately, what, what I want to do, and uh, this can be pretty interactive, if you have an opportunity uh, to throw, throw a comment in the, the chat or the Q&A, but I'm curious, uh, do those of you that are on, do you utilize synchronization in your herd? Estra synchronization or, or, or maybe uh, AI? So if you want, feel free, you can add that in the chat give you a few minutes if you can. If you can't, um, 
maybe we can get some thumbs up, but just an opportunity to get you guys thinking um, about this topic today. So Quentin said, yes, perfect. Anybody else? Um, give you an opportunity. If, you're, if they want to raise their hands, they can do that. Ooh, perfect. Thanks, Vinny. Yeah, so if you want to raise your hand, I can take a look at the participants here uh, and see if anybody raises their hand. I know this, this technology can be quite confusing. So if not, no worries, but curious and, oh, we got some yeses here in the Q&A, perfect. We use it for heifers, uh, use synchronization, uh, but they do not use time uh, for, they don't have time for heat detect, perfect. Thanks, Kyle. We'll talk about a little bit about, uh, about heat detection here, um, but just curious, kind of wanting to know what, what our audience is uh, thinking about in terms of synchronization. So thank you. Uh, everyone for throwing some comments in the, the Q&A session. So what spurred my question is uh, some survey work from the USDA NOMS uh, reported that less than 8% of beef cattle in the U.S. are artificially inseminating cattle. And so this is one of those reproductive technologies that we'll, we'll talk about today, but ultimately why so few? Um, this you know, has been around for a while um, in terms of utilizing this technology, but according to NOMS, the number one reason why producers don't use AI or estrogen synchronization is time and labor. And there are certain protocols that can be pretty uh, laborious. And so hopefully we can talk through some different options today, maybe get you thinking about uh, utilizing a, a, a simple protocol uh, and what some of those benefits might be. And so when we break that down, roughly about 7.9% of our uh, US beef operations use estrus synchronization, uh, and only 7.6% of those operations are, are utilizing AI. And so we've got a lot of room for advancement here uh, with these technologies, and we'll talk about some of those benefits here in the next few slides. Um, but a very small proportion of the operations that were, were surveyed in the US uh, utilize some of these technologies. And so when we think about some of those reasons for not utilizing estrus synchronization, obviously you see here on the slide, roughly about 39% of operations say that the time and labor component is a big driver. Uh, then we, we start to look at some of these other options that producers selected, thinking about cost. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit today. Uh, lack of facilities. Um, this can be a big one depending on the number of times we're going to need to be moving animals through the chute and, and given shot. So that can be a concern. Uh, too difficult or complicated. I think this is a great opportunity to have some conversations with your extension personnel give me a call and I'm happy to work through some of these different protocols. Uh, and, and we've got some other reproductive physiologists um, out in the state that can also help uh, work through some of these protocols. And hopefully we can talk about uh, some of those challenges today. So I wanted to, to throw some other data at you and, and thinking about our bull battery. A majority of operations or a percentage of those cows and, and heifers that are bre being bred within a cat breeding season um, are utilizing bulls. We have a very small percentage that are utilizing um, AI or, or maybe even using AI and exposing to bulls, or maybe we're thinking about buying some of those bred heifers. Uh, and so we're, we're taking out that extra labor uh, piece with synchronization or, or AI. And so we know that majority of our operations are utilizing bulls. Uh, so is there a program or a protocol that we can use to help with our, our bull breeding herds? And so estrus synchronization is uh, a way that we can utilize um, some synchronization and, and we'll get into some of the the nuances of our protocols and, and our hormones and how we might be able to tweak some of this. Um, but ultimately, we can utilize synchronization to help alter that calving season. Uh, we can also try and decrease that breeding season length. Uh, and Travis touched on, you know, thinking about body condition, our postpartum interval, and did a great job this morning setting up 
kind of some of those other factors that we really need to think about in terms of management for getting uh, successful sink programs and breeding programs uh, once we move through, you know, that, that winter and, and calving season. And so we can utilize synchronization and target select animals that are not cycling. So some of those uh, cows later in, in the calving season that may, might have those shorter postpartum intervals, we might be able to target some of those cows to move them up. And so when we're thinking about utilizing synchronization with our, uh, our bulls, uh, this might be an opportunity for those that don't use AI um, just to, to work on targeting specific aspects of your, your breeding program uh, or, or altering the, that calving season. <clears throat> so what is an ideal synchronization protocol? So ultimately, we want to have a high number of females that respond to our treatments. Um, we, we don't want to impact fertility. We want high conception rates. A lot of that is going to be related to nutrition and, and status of those females. Um, so Travis touched on that and I think uh, set, set me up really well thinking about some of those other requirements and, and nutrients that are going to be, you know, there for lactation and, you know, and reproduction on this backside we want to make sure that we're having a calf every year. And so we might be able to use some of these protocols uh, to catch up on some of those females. Uh, we want to see estrus in those females occurring at a specific time after our treatments. Uh, but we might also be able to utilize some of these protocols that uh, we, we aren't looking at heat detection and, and we're maybe using a time AI or synchronizing females and, and letting our bulls do the work. Uh, another ideal um, would be having females that are gathered um, a few few times. And so that labor and that time piece is going to be critical here. And so we have a number of different options that we, we can talk about later. Um, and then being able to, to maybe target our cyclic or non-cyclic females. So there are a lot of different options. What we need uh, to implement one of these programs, well-planned program. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the tools that we can utilize uh, to set up some of our protocols. Uh, there's a number of different checklists and things to make sure that we have all of the, the equipment necessary to, to make sure that we uh, keep these as simple as possible. Uh, body condition and nutrition are going to be key. Um, and then making sure we're also thinking about our vaccination programs and 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 the timing of those. And so making sure that we're, we're talking with our vet, we're ensuring that we're at least 30 days uh, before breeding when we're, we're going through our vaccination programs are gonna be uh, pretty critical because some of those modified live vaccines can actually uh, impact our, our fertility and, and those responses to sync programs. Um, that can be uh, for another day. And if you have questions, we can definitely highlight some of that. Um, but again, one of those concerns for why producers aren't implementing some of these sync programs is working facilities. And so we do need to know that we're gonna run uh, these animals in at least a minimum of a one or two times. And so we need to be able to have an alley, a chute, uh, somewhere we can um, gather these animals. Uh, if we're gonna be using a, an MGA product, we need to be able to have uh, adequate bunk space uh, to ensure that all those females are consuming uh, our product uh, during that, that sink time period. Uh, one other option we can think about is having some records or being able to identify those females. Maybe we're selecting a specific number of animals that we're gonna try and, and synchronize or maybe AI. And so having some records and, and, and being able to document that will help on, on the back end when we go to, to preg check and, and looking at when conceptions, conception was. Um, and then also being able to train uh, those that are detecting estrus if we are utilizing a heat detection program. Uh, what are those signs? And so we'll talk about that here a little later. So what are some potential advantages for uh, utilizing an estrus sync program? Uh, when we when we think about some of the big major uh, advantages would be concentrating that breeding season. 
So we can concentrate that calving period. We're gonna have more uniform calf crop with those calves being uh, born within a, you know, an earlier time point within that calving season. Uh, we can manage those cows a little more effectively. And so if we know uh, the, the um, you know, if they're AI or maybe um, or natural service, uh, we can manage those groups in terms of, of calving groups um, and even uh, nutritional groups as well, depending on if we have females that maybe uh, need a little extra energy or protein, depending on, on when we're working through some of these programs. And um, it's an opportunity to concentrate some of that later labor. So, you know, are we going to have a majority of our calves born earlier or maybe spread out? Maybe we can concentrate um, within that calving, that time frame uh, within that breeding season. Our um, sink programs also make AI programs practical by reducing that time later labor for heat detection. So there are some fixed time uh, protocols that we'll talk about today. Uh, and even some sync programs that utilize natural service uh, where we can reduce that time and labor associated with heat detection uh, and utilize some other hormones and, and, and protocols that can help with that. This also uh, allows us to use a leader of those superior bulls um, via AI or natural service. And so if you have a select number of, of cows that you might want to, to AI to a particular bull to increase our genetics, uh, this is a great opportunity to, to even select uh, a small number of females um, to help uh, advance those, those genetics within your herd. Um, due to time, I'm not going to be able to really touch on it, but there's also opportunities with embryo transfer and utilizing some of these programs as well to help increase those genetics within your herd. So depending on what your, your program goals are um, and objectives within your, your breeding program, a lot, of the, a lot of that will depend um, on what those goals are, but there are a lot of different options. Uh, and ultimately, um, estrus synchronization programs have been shown to produce calves that on average were 13 days older and roughly 21 pounds heavier uh, than those non-synchronized female, um, those calves. So um, there are some opportunities for older, more uniform calf crop uh, utilizing some of these programs. So what are some of those long-term benefits? Uh, heifers that calve earlier in their first calving season tend to stay in that herd longer and produce more pounds of calf during their lifetime than those heifers that are calving later. Uh, Dr. Cushman is on and will be able to talk uh, this afternoon thinking about um, some heifer development and dry lots, but uh, they've done some research here in Nebraska that's clearly demonstrated that value of that heifer conceiving within that first 21 days of the breeding season. And so if you can see that uh, the heifers with the, the solid line here um, remain in that herd, a greater percentage of those females uh, over that lifetime or, or multiple calving seasons compared to those heifers um, after that, that 21 days within that breeding season. So in terms of improving longevity and that genetic merit, uh, there's a lot to say uh, with utilizing uh, some of these protocols. There's also some work out of Colorado that um, looked at uh, a 19 years worth of, of records and data uh, from the ranch in Saratoga and, and looked at the effects of artificial insemination or natural service on heifer performance. And basically this was lifetime performance. So any heifers that were either AI or um, born to natural, um, natural service. And so what they noted was females that conceived to AI as a yearling were older and they uh, were heavier at the time, time of AI compared to those heifers that were conceived to that cleanup bull uh, via natural service. Uh, they did not see any differences with, um, in postpartum interval, uh, which were pretty similar that 92 and 87 days. Uh, but in terms of um, looking at that calf performance, and so over the over uh, that, you know, almost 20 years, they roughly had um, due to some of their selection criteria, they had a larger number of calves uh, in that data set um, due to, to AI, uh, 
Um, but looking at the, that effect of calf performance, uh, those, uh, the, those calves that uh, were conceived to AI, uh, rather than that cleanup bull um, with natural service, uh, they, they weaned an additional uh, 699 pounds. Uh, and over that lifetime uh, of, of that data set, actually produced two more calves over that lifetime uh, compared to, the, to those that were um, conceived natural service. So there was some other work looking at the impact of time AI on the percentage of cows that are calving. And so uh, they utilized a, a co-sync and a cedar uh, protocol. And so we'll, we'll dive into some of these, these different protocols, but ultimately uh, here, uh, from Rogers and others in 2012, you can see that um, the, the gray bars are going to be our timed AI and then our, our control or our natural service is going to be in the red. And you can see that the majority of those females um, calving early uh, are, are due to that timed AI. And then we see a large majority are basically hitting that second cycle of uh, natural service. And so when we look at the impact on calving and then also subsequent impacts on weaning, uh, you see uh, a greater percentage of, of calves being born early in that breeding or calving season. Um, so roughly 44% within that first 21 days um, to, a, to AI compared to 24% uh, of the calves being born uh, natural service. And so then we start seeing a majority of the, those calves um, from natural service are, are being born in that, in that second wave uh, of, of that cycle. So when we break that down a little further and look at those impacts um, on the number of the different cows that were in this study, the, the percent weaning rate and that weaning weight, uh, we can see that compared uh, to our control or that natural service, uh, there was an additional 38 pounds in weaning weight. Um, and then there was a $49 increase uh, in returns from the Time AI group uh, with that additional 38 pounds um, per cow exposed. And so uh, they were looking at a 121 um, hundred weight selling, average selling price for those and saw an increase in returns uh, with that additional weight and weaning rate for those calves um, due to, to time AI. And so there are a number of resources that we can use when we're thinking about maybe figuring out what the, the best protocol is, is for your operation. And so uh, there's a couple links here and, and we'll dive into some of the resources on the page, but the Bee Free Productive Task Force is a group of extension and, and research professionals uh, that uh, are in beef and dairy uh, at the universities and uh, in, in USDA that work through these different protocols uh, and provide these resources uh, for producers and, and honestly anyone wanting to to utilize some of these different reproductive technologies. And so uh, one of the, the resources that they provide are these synchronization protocols. And we'll, we'll dive into these a little bit uh, here towards the end, uh, but there's a number of different protocols uh, based on heat detection, timed AI, uh, fixed time AI, or um, if we're even utilizing some of those boss indicus cows, uh, what, what some of the research has shown in terms of fixed AI uh, protocols. Um, we also have a few different options for our heifers, uh, thinking about you know, those same categories, um, but there's also that inclusion of that MGA product, which we'll talk about. One tool uh, that I utilize in class and, and a lot of uh, different um, <clears throat> people use and utilize is the estrus synchronization planner. So this, this prints out a calendar. It gives you a worksheet, uh, tips and, and overviews uh, that you can use uh, depending on when you want to calve 
or maybe what time you want to breed. So if you want to uh, get done right before the 4th of July and um, or maybe you want to utilize all the family coming home uh, over uh, over the holiday, uh, there's an opportunity to to look at the timing of when some of these programs are occurring. And then uh, we can we can plug that into this planner. It gives us a, a great worksheet printout of when we need to administer our different products. And then um, you, you can follow this to the T um, with just adding a few different uh, things of, of information into this program. So it's a great resource uh, for anyone uh, wanting to follow those links, you're more than happy to. One other tool that the um, Beef Reproductive Task Force uh, provides us on one of their resources is the AI calculator, uh, which is um, in an app and was developed by the group uh, at Florida as well as uh, uh, the groups below here um, <clears throat> and under the resources tab. Um, but this is a great uh, tool that can compare natural service costs, uh, different cow herd related costs, uh, the costs associated with AI, and then look at utilizing a, a quick partial budget to make some of those decision tools. And so uh, this is a resource. And then um, our group here uh, also developed a breeding cost calculator. And the link uh, to this calculator um, is provided. And uh, this is an Excel sheet. And uh, you can input, enter all your costs here in terms of natural service and AI costs, and then um, any bull information or synchronization or heat detection tools and can use those comparisons. So a lot of great resources um, that are available. Um, and, and so if you have any questions related to any of the tools, uh, reach out to any of us and, and we'll be happy to, to walk through uh, these different tools. And so what are some of uh, the different estro synchronization protocols? No, we have a lot of material to cover, so I just want to briefly touch on some of the different protocols and utilization of, of these different programs. And so what does synchronization really mean? Ultimately, our goal is to manipulate that cow's estrus cycle to where all those cows within that herd will be cycling at the same time or relatively close to the same time. And so, kind of want to take us back to our repro classes uh, and physiology and, and get everybody on the same page. So what are some of those main hormones in, in beef reproduction? So we'll, we'll highlight our estrous cycle here on the next page, but some of those key players are going to be GnRH, which is going to help release FSH and LH. FSH is going to help that development of our follicles, and our luteinizing hormone is going to help with ovulation. Then we've got some of these hormones over here. So estradiol, this is going to be that behavior, those characteristics of breeding and receptivity. Um, and so we'll talk through some, uh, some of those behaviors. And, and this will be really critical at time of ovulation when we're, we're heat detecting and watching those females in, in that different behavior that we're, we're supposed to be looking for. Progesterone, this is our pregnancy hormone. This maintains pregnancy and prevents estrus or ovulation. And so we've got a, a few different um, products that can help. And so we'll, we'll touch on those um, here in the next few slides. And then prostaglandin is gonna lyse our CL and it also is um, associated with smooth muscle contractions. So we see, we see spikes um, during the, the estrus cycle and also at, at parturition. Uh, with, with prostaglandin. So these will all be pretty important when we move through the next few slides. So recap of our bovine estrus cycle. So our cycle, I, I usually ask my students in class, uh, how long is our estrus cycle, OUS versus US? And so estrus is that, that active, that, that activity or that behavior that's occurring uh, and then our estrus cycle is going to be that 21 day cycle. And so we have ovulation that occurred and then we start our cycle all over again. And so we have 
spikes of hormones, so LH and uh, FSH. And then we also have um, our estra estrogen that's gonna be at pretty low levels um, over that course of that estrous cycle and then spike at, um, at time of estrus. Um, and then we'll have our LH surge. And then we also have that, um, that estrus uh, spike um, or estradiol spike right at estrus and ovulation. And so then again, at that 21 days, uh, we have ovulation occurring and, and we've got um, receptivity and, and behavior uh, of those females. And so one other aspect I wanna touch on is thinking about this three-wave model. And so uh, we'll talk about how we can manipulate the cycle and utilize specific uh, hormones to try and target certain aspects within the cycle. And so uh, we have that ovulation occurring uh, we have spikes of our hormones or that pulsatile uh, response to those hormones over those days. And then we have development of our uh, different follicles uh, within those different waves. And so we have um, this growth and then we have atresia of or, or death of some of those follicles. And then this, this happens again. And so Typically, we, we see roughly two to three of these waves. Uh, and then what we, what we see occurring is that ovulation. And then this is an opportunity um, for conception or we move through this cycle again. And so some keys for some of this synchronization success is um, having cows at least 50 days postpartum. Uh, Travis talked about this anywhere. Uh, between that body condition score four to six. Uh, and so ensuring that those cows are meeting those requirements for maintenance and, and then thinking about reproduction and lactation and, and being able to uh, successfully um, return to estrus uh, will be important. If we're synchronizing using MGA, we'll talk about this product here in the next couple slides. This is for heifers only. Uh, we need to ensure that we have plenty of bunk space and we're feeding this product and we know that all of our females are consuming targeted rates. And so ensuring that there's plenty of bunk space, there's also strategies where we can feed uh, maybe half of this product uh, in the morning feeding, and then also um, you know, finish up that, that feeding of MGA uh, in the afternoon to ensure that some of those uh, maybe lower on the totem pole animals or um, you know, those, those animals that are pretty aggressive, um, everyone's getting uh, an equal amount of, of that product. Um, we mentioned this early uh, in, in the talk, but working with our veterinarian, uh, making sure vaccinations are current and understanding the timing of when these need to, to happen prior to synchronization in our products. Um, so are we utilizing modified live? Or, or killed vaccines, how long prior to that breeding season do we need to administer those uh, to ensure those, those animals are current uh, prior to that breeding season? Um, one fun tip, uh, making sure we, we cut those cedars. Um, we, we get cows that can get pretty bored, especially if they're in a dry lot scenario uh, and, and start pulling some of those cedars out. So, uh, we, we see better retention if we can make sure that we don't give those cows an opportunity to um, start pulling cedars out. Now, mentioned this earlier, if we want to use natural service with estrus synchronization, um, big key player here is making sure our bulls are ready to go prior to that breeding season. So if we can uh, get a breeding soundness exam on those bulls, make sure that you know, they meet our minimum scrotal circumference um, as yearlings. Um, and if we're utilizing synchronization, uh, we generally will recommend using older, more mature bulls, uh, just to ensure that uh, they know what they're doing uh, and they don't get burnout having to breed um, a number of females in a shorter window of time. And so generally what we'll recommend is a one to 15 or one to 20 bull to female ratio. Um, and it's good to have at least two bulls within those breeding pastures, just to make sure um, that we're monitoring those bulls uh, and 
due to some of those dominance uh, issues that we see, we, we know that these bulls are, are covering females um, and we don't have just one bull having to work at a concentrated period of time. So wanna run through some of our hormones, thinking about um, how we can utilize these within our protocols. So some of the big key players here are gonna be prostaglandin, GnRH, and our progestins. So again, prostaglandin, it causes that regression of our CL, um, but it does not have an effect on those, those females that are still in anestrus. So um, we, we can't jumpstart those females with prostaglandin. Um, that uterine environment is still trying to, to recuperate and get ready again for that next breeding season and, and to hold, you know, that calf for that next year. And so um, there's some other strategies that we can use uh, with some of those anestrous females. This is only effective during that first uh, six days after estrus or, you know, the first six days of the estrus cycle and then towards the end of the estrus cycle. So, just wanted to, to illustrate that. So if remember, estrus and ovulation does not work if we give prostaglandin here within that first six days. When we have that follicle that's developing, it will regress that CL. And this is where we're trying to target those females that might be mid-cycle, where we can actually get them to cycle and, and, and target some earlier conception with those females utilizing prostaglandin. Some of those different products that you've seen on the shelf or maybe heard of, uh, Lutalize, Estromate, Estroplan. Um, reading labels and understanding how much needs to be administered per dose will be important. Uh, these will, will target different rates. And so um, making sure that we're reading labels will be important, uh, knowing the difference between our prostaglandin and our GNR, GNRH products. So gonadotropin releasing hormone, GnRH. So this is um, this can be a, a single injection that's given to females at random stages within their cycle. It will result in an LH surge, which ultimately will lead to that ovulation um, or luteinization of those large healthy follicles. Um, but we do not see that estrus response. But we do see that that ovulation is occurring. Uh, this will initiate our follicle turnover or jumpstart and start that new wave. So if you remember uh, those waves that we were talking about earlier, this will jumpstart a wave depending on where they're at. And we can, um, we can jumpstart some of those cycles uh, and those females to try and get a majority of those females to cycle within the same, same time period. <clears throat> our, our prostaglandins will regress GnRH and induce that CL or that corpus luteum seven days later. GnRH is one that can induce estrous cycles in our anestrous females uh, that are close to cycling. So if we're, we're getting close to that at least 50 day target postpartum, we can start um, jump starting some of those females uh, that may, um, may still be in anestrous uh, with utilization of GnRH. So just want to illustrate uh, this for you guys. So if we inject GnRH, we'll stimulate that surge and then release of LH that triggers ovulation. And so um, we don't see an estrus response. However, roughly 20 to 30 hours later um, after that injection, we will see ovulation um, with those females that have large healthy follicles. So some of those products you might have seen or, or heard, so Factrol, Cisterellin, uh, Fergadol, and Ovacis are just a, a, a couple of the products. And again, understanding the dosage is going to be very important uh, for each of these different products. So making sure that we have a list, we understand when and how much needs to be administered will be pretty critical in terms of a successful protocol. The last product I wanted to touch on here are progestins. So these will block ovulation. Uh, and this is another great tool that can induce estrus in those anestrous females. And so again, we're jump starting those cycles. 
And so if we have some of those females and maybe we want to target those late calving cows and, and move them up into, in, into that calving season, um, we can utilize some of these products to help jumpstart those females that might be at the later end of, um, of calving. So the two different products are gonna be our CEDAR, which is our controlled internal drug release device, um, and MGA. So MGA, again, is a product, uh, medicated product for heifers. We need to ensure that this is um, and a consistent intake for this product. Um, CEDARS, uh, we've got some different protocols we'll talk about. But ultimately, when we're thinking about cedars, these can help stimulate um, our estrus cycle. Uh, there's some work from Lamb and others in 2001. And this is just one of the studies that I wanted to highlight for those. We can get a, a large majority of those females that are not cycling um, to, to cycle um, and, and reset some of the late calving cows. So this was some work uh, that was able to, to jumpstart some of those females. Um, and there's a number of different pro protocols that we can look at and, and utilize those seeders and, and progestin devices. So again, um, these sync protocols have a lot of different as aspects to them in terms of when we need to administer our gene or H, when we need to administer our prostaglandin, when we might need to incorporate our, our cedar or progestin products, and then how long until we either breed those females or maybe we can turn those females out with a bull. So the first protocol or topic I, I want to discuss today is heat detection AI protocols. So these are where we are observing heat. So what is heat? This is that short period of receptivity of those open cows and heifers. It generally will last about eight to 18 hours. Um, this is pretty variable depending on, <clears throat> on the, the breed of cattle, um, the, the age, a uh, number of different factors. But we, we have this window that we, we usually will see a response. And so when we are heat detecting, we need to make sure that we are observing standing heat. So these are the females that are receptive to other females that are mounting. And so in the picture, you can see that this female is receptive. She's not running away. Um, she, she will stand uh, for those females that are mounting. We start seeing some secondary char characteristics as well. And those are gonna include mounting other cows, uh, we can see rough and tail heads in those, those cows that have um, been mounted. Uh, they're going to be real friendly. We're going to see uh, head pressing and, and licking and a lot of um, secondary characteristics that are going to um, show that the, these females are, um, are ready uh, to be bred. Uh, we'll also see nervous or restlessness, a lot of walking. Uh, with those females during um, standing heat. And then towards the end, we'll, we'll see a clear mucus um, and a swollen vulva. And then um, for those females that, if you're really taking a close look, uh, we see a, a bloody mucus. Um, that's going to tell us that these females were in heat. And so um, we've got a picture here that, that does a great job of illustrating that this female has that bloody mucus discharge, she was in heat. Um, this is one of our um, heat patches uh, that has a transponder on there. And so we, we did some research with heifers uh, in confinement looking at some estrus um, activity and some eating behavior. Um, and so this is one of the tools that we can use for heat detection. Um, heat detection is a big time commitment. Uh, we need to check at least two times daily, uh, every 20 or 30 minutes um, can add up pretty quick. And so if you, you've got a good idea of when those females are going to be coming into heat, depending on what time you administered or pulled cedars um, and what time you want to breed, uh, 
we can then back and, and take a look at that time that we need to go and make sure that we're, we're heat detecting those females. Uh, we need to know the signs. And so um, are, are those females standing uh, for how long? Um, one really helpful tool during heat detection protocols is utilizing or combining uh, a visual aid to help. So that might be some of our Estrotech patches um, or tail chalking. Uh, there's a lot of different technologies out there now um, that look and utilize pedometers and some other estrus detection uh, systems um, that, that can help us aid in heat detection. And so uh, it's just some of those here, the, the heat watch system, uh, you need to be able to, to have the, the, the space for having that base, base system and the computer system um, to be able to send and, and respond and, and transmit those, those reads. Uh, the Estrotech patches are extremely helpful and, and visual uh, depending on a single or multiple mounts um, or you'll see those as, as, you know, hot pink or green, whatever color you pick. Um, and they're, they're really great visual aids. Here, um, the, the chalk the, um, and dairies is pretty popular. Uh, the Kmart patches are a little older, but these, these pop after um, multiple mountings. And so a lot of great, uh, great tools to help and assist um, with, with AI and, and heat detection. So briefly want to touch on fixed time AI, a number of different protocols if we're thinking about our cows here on the left. Um, and then our, our heifers have a couple different pro protocols, um, shorter term or longer term protocols. Um, so these are going to be anywhere from seven to nine days um, with um, at least three, three times through the shoot. Um, we also have 17 day protocols. Um, and or um, NGA protocols uh, that on roughly the 33rd to 36th day, we'll, we'll start seeing estrus response in, in AI those females. So what does fixed time AI mean? This is where all our cows are gonna be synchronized uh, to be bred at the same time. So say we wanna uh, start gathering cows up at five in the morning, we want to, to be ready and have that first cow through the chute at six o'clock. Um, this is a great time where we can gather these females and, and do one mass breeding. And so theoretically, these animals are gonna be ovulating at the same time. Um, sometimes that's not the case, but we can utilize uh, those urinary shots and some of our other hormones uh, to help with ovulation in these fixed time protocols. And so we can AI um, and then and give a shot of GNRH. So any of those, those females that have not exhibited estrus, we can actually um, get those, those females to, to ovulate um, and increase the, those conception rates in those females that may just be a little late in terms of um, estrus response. So if you guys do have any questions, feel free to, to add anything into the Q&A or the chat. Um, I know Hannah has done a great job of updating the chat with those links um, to those protocols. Um, I want to shift gears here um, briefly, just kind of thinking about those costs associated uh, with estrus synchronization um, and looking at some of these different protocols. And so we, we could dive into to these topics um, a little more in depth, but I, um, I really just want to, to be able to highlight some of those. And if we have some questions at the end, we can, we can try and answer anything that you guys do have. Um, but this was um, a, a great summary from Johnson and others um, looking at conception rates um, to a five-day AI period or a single time insemination. So they looked at heifers and cows and, and compared a number of different uh, protocols that I mentioned earlier. And so typically, depending on the protocol, um, that that range is going to vary. And there's a number of different factors. We talked about nutrition, postpartum, estrus response. And so we will see a range for conception rates. So for heifers, um, typically anywhere from 50 to 60% conception rate uh, with uh, these different protocols. 
For cows, we'll see similar 50 to 60. However, depending on the, um, the technician and, you know, in nutrition and response, we can see these numbers increase, but this, these are kind of the, those typical numbers that we will see. But if we think back to some of those advantages of <clears throat> increasing that genetic potential for those calves, a more uniform calf crop, there are, there are some opportunities here when we think about conception rates to AI or we're synchronizing these females and moving them up in that breeding season. When we think about breeding season costs, uh, this is for a herd size of 100 head. Um, and so comparing these different systems, uh, 100 head looking at roughly four bulls, that's going to cost us about $35 a pregnancy. Um, this is a purchase price. This was back in 2004, mind you, of uh, $2,500. And so we, we would have to adjust that depending on, on that price that we're purchasing those bulls. But We've got some great tools that I mentioned and you guys have links to that are the great resources to do some of those comparisons. If we wanna look at utilizing a select number of animals um, with one of these systems and then utilize natural service, um, there's a lot of different combinations that we can use, um, but we're looking anywhere from that 40 to $60 per pregnancy range uh, for utilization of, of some of these different systems. And what I want to know is the total hours and, and that labor associated with these. So depending on the pro protocol that we select, um, we're going to have multiple days that we're going to need to be working some of these, these animals depending on the protocol. And so um, we can look at that time and, and labor associated with it. Uh, we're, we're assuming a 50% preg rate. Um, and then we've got those cleanup bowls. And so that price and that time will vary depending on the protocol. And so we can take a look at that and, and do some comparisons. And one nice thing about the, the Estra Synchronization Planner is we can compare a couple different systems uh, depending on that number of days we're working uh, and, and that cost and, and look at the differences between the costs of our different um, products. Um, and we can start making some of those decisions as well. So um, just want you guys to think about that cost range, um, but some of those additional benefits that we might have uh, looking at incorporating these into our breeding systems. So uh, when we think about artificial insemination costs, um, we, we do have fixed costs that are gonna be associated with uh, semen tanks and, and liquid nitrogen and the carrying case and pipette guns and uh, sheets and, and things that we need to be able to have to get the job done in terms of, of AI. And so having a skilled technician um, initially, if we're thinking about implementing these, these programs, is going to be pretty critical to ensure that we, we can have um, you know, the, the best options for conception rates uh, working through these these programs. Then we're going to have semen costs. This can vary depending on the bowl um, and you know if we're wanting to target maybe sex semen, if we want to try and um, increase the number of bull calves or maybe heifer calves that we're going to have, uh, this is an opportunity to utilize some of those technologies with our semen options. Um, this was um, about $14 per unit. This can increase depending a lot of this is going to depend on what your target breeding goals are um, and, and the type of bulls that you're wanting to use in your system. Uh, then we got to think about our prostaglandin, which is going to be about 250 a dose, GnRH, and then our cedars. So this will vary depending on which protocol we use if we want to incorporate cedars or maybe we just want to give a couple shots and then we need to think about um, those supplies and fixed costs. But that's kind of a breakdown. Um, with, with costs associated with some of these programs and things we need to think about. <clears throat> this is a, a nice summary uh, about pregnancy and synchronized heifers bred to AI or natural service. And so uh, this was utilizing MGA for 14 days uh, and then prostaglandin 16 days post MGA. Uh, so 80 heifers for AI and natural service. And um, the heifers in estrus, um, 
in the first six days was roughly that 95%. So we had really good response. Um, and then we, we had um, pretty decent pregnancy rates within that range that we're typically, typically going to see with these different sync programs. Um, and so we, you know, we can see, see some differences here, but we're within that first 30 days, um, we're at 70 to 80% um, um, pregnancy uh, between AI and actual service. So a lot of opportunities. This is just one example, um, but we can utilize these, this program and heifers um, and increase that, um, those genetics to, to AI or um, get those females synchronized early in that breeding season. So a lot of great opportunities um, and things to consider. Uh, with implementing some of these different reproductive technologies. So just want to summarize here, um, Travis did a great job thinking about how we can prepare those females uh, going into calving and, and that subsequent breeding season. Uh, and so nutrition, body condition, and postpartum interval, interval are all going to be critical for success of our synchronization program. And so depending on where these females are at, or maybe we're wanting to target some of those anestrous females, um, what, what our nutrition and that body condition score looks like in those females is gonna be pretty, pretty critical. Um, the nice thing or, or something to consider with utilizing some of these technologies is you get to decide when your cows are, are getting pregnant. So this helps with genetic improvement we can synchronize those females and get more cows pregnant earlier. Um, we'll have more calves born earlier and ultimately more pounds born earlier. Um, <clears throat> we, we saw the research from Cushman and others, um, <clears throat> French and others, and um, even in Rogers and others, with those heifers that are born early in that calving season, having greater lifetime productivity. And so if we're wanting to, to increase that, that those genetics within our herd. Uh, and we know that we can retain those females that are born early in that calving season. Um, this is a great opportunity to look at lifetime productivity and, and target some of those fertility and breeding objectives that we have uh, within the herd. And ultimately, hopefully, uh, if you guys do have questions or, or take a look at those links in the chat, but we have a number of synchronization tools that can help uh, and, and we can work through what some of those um, synchronization protocols and, um, <clears throat> and AI protocols might be, might be best for your operation. And so depending on your resources, your help, um, your time, and your labor, uh, these might be some great considerations or opportunities um, to help uh, increase, increase that pound of calf and, and ultimately that lifetime productivity of our females. So with that, hopefully we stayed on time a bit. Um, if you guys do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, and then I'll turn the floor over to Hannah and see what questions we might have in our, our Q&A. Awesome. Thank you, Casey. Uh, like she said, in an effort to stay on time, Casey, I'm going to have you monitor the Q&A box. Travis did a really good job of responding to his questions, so no pressure on dropping the ball oh, there. Great. <laughs> So if you don't mind to kind of uh, reply to some of those questions and feel free to add questions in there as Casey will be able to respond to those through the rest of the morning. So don't hesitate if you've got a thought here in a few minutes to drop that in there. I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch over to our next presentation and I'm going to invite Clay to go ahead and start sharing his screen if he would like. Earlier I mentioned how today's sponsors provide products and services that keep our cattle operations functioning at their most productive and All Flex Livestock Intelligence is truly a prime example of that with their cutting edge technology. So Casey's gonna go ahead and stop sharing her screen real quick and we're gonna throw Clay's slides up there because with today, today with us we have Clay Mead. He's a member of the All Flex Beef Monitoring Team. Clay, thank you for taking the time to detail more about All Flex with us and his sponsor presentation could not have been timed any better in our program with how some of their beef systems tie into Dr. McCarthy's presentation. Clay, thank you for your sponsorship of today and the floor is all yours. Yeah, thanks Hannah. Can, uh, I guess I should first check, can everybody hear me and see my screen? Yes, sir, you are coming through loud and clear. 
Yeah, it's a it's a test of my technology patience this morning. It seems like so I'm glad glad to be here. Um, I think this does tie in uh, fairly well with both uh, Dr. McCarthy and then uh, Dr. Molinex uh, this morning on what I guess I'm really going to present on. Um, I'm going to be very brief here because I realize I'm standing in between a bathroom break and lunch, so I will be uh, fairly brief here. But just wanted to just highlight just something real quick with what Allflex is providing. Um, now. Uh, we have been for the last few years. Um, and I guess really first I should just um, state who we are uh, as a company. Uh, Allflex Livestock Intelligence. Uh, we can add livestock intelligence to our name now because we have a, a full portfolio, not just, just manage visual ID anymore, uh, but that portfolio uh, also includes uh, managing disease traceability through uh, something uh, like RFID. Um, tissue collection for uh, managing uh, genomics. Uh, again, like I said, visual ID, but now we're in the monitoring space, uh, have been for, for a while now, uh, at least on the dairy side, but particularly uh, what I'm gonna obviously talk about on the beef side uh, for the last few years um, is monitoring uh, estrus and health. And so really, um, what is it, I guess, essentially what I want to talk about is really our ear tag. Allflex is uh, a leader in ear tags, but now we bring that ear tag um, really into monitoring. Um, it, it, this piece is essentially for the beef cow. Um, not necessarily, this piece is not necessarily on the feed yard side. Uh, that, that's a different piece that we will start managing uh, coming down the road, but this is for the beef cow. And really what does this ear tag allow us to do, whether um, as a producer uh, and so forth, it's it, really, it's, I liken it to a Fitbit that we would uh, maybe wear um, if you know, we were wearing one at home to uh, monitor our, maybe our eating habits, activity, whatever that is. Uh, but this, this tag, essentially what you see on the left here, um, comes down to three basic concepts. Um, it's estrus monitoring, health detection and group monitoring. Uh, so those are the three basic concepts that I'll cover and that this product uh, will monitor down the road. And so uh, there's a lot going on on this, um, on this screen right here, uh, but just, uh, just real briefly, um, you're looking at uh, basically the algorithms that the product will manage or, or look at, will look at and those algorithms that it is monitoring will be activity, uh, rumination, eating, like I mentioned before. But on the left, as we would look, um, I realize there's a lot going on here, but on the top, we're monitoring uh, heat detection, uh, looking at heat graphs. Um, and so being able to really key in on an individual, on a cow or a heifer, on when she is, um, when the system's estimating that she is in heat, and really to detail into when the, when the system's gonna estimate that she's going to ovulate is key into increasing uh, maybe our conception rates. We're also managing some labor. Um, you know, Dr. McCarthy talked about managing labor costs, or excuse me, talked about managing hormone costs. Uh, you know, we can utilize different uh, synchronization protocols and through all that we can manage those labor costs as well. Um, and again, uh, we had also talked about, uh, Dr. Molnick's talked this morning about uh, managing days to first estrus, um, especially on those cows, maybe getting those heifers cycling uh, before breeding season. Um, obviously that's gonna be very important into our conception rates later on. Um, you know, managing and monitoring postpartum intervals uh, to keep those cows calving in a 365 day uh, window is gonna be very important, especially bringing, um, our investment back to our operation. And then uh, Dr. McCarthy also talked about, um, you know, managing those anesterous cows, maybe with, um, uh, with progesterins, uh, progestins, excuse me. Um, you know, just some different protocols that we can use, but how do we really know that they're in anesterous? Um, that, that's gonna be one key thing, um, us as producers, uh, maybe we really need to know, are they cycling? Are they in anesterous? What do we really have going on on our operation? And then a couple other key things here, we can just uh, look down that next graph is just monitoring some health. Um, health being, we're looking at rumination, activity and eating. And then on the bottom screen, we're looking at 
uh, group consistency, if we're monitoring those cows as a group and not just as uh, individuals. And so then uh, just to key in on this just a little bit closer, this is a heat graph that the system will allow you to look at. Uh, we are monitoring uh, through an index, zero to 100 is our index. We're looking at heat behavior. How strong are those heats? How reliable is that heat? Um, this is just looking at a graph on a 60 day window in time of this example heifer here. She started off with a really strong heat. You know, maybe she started cycling before we got to our breeding season. And that's a good thing. That's what we wanna know. We've, we're, we're on the right track with managing these cattle. Uh, we got them going already. Um, and so then later on towards the right, more current timing, we see her come in with the heat again. Maybe it's a weaker heat, um, but you know, that's something that we can manage in our system. We can still breed off of, but we really know what's going on and when she's coming in the heat and how reliable those heats are. So this is a lot of data on the system, but the important thing for a producer in my mind is not necessarily the data, that's a lot of cool stuff coming at us, but the important stuff is, is the information coming out of the system. What do we really need to know about our cows and what do we really need to know coming out of the system? It's this information. Was she in heat? And when was she in heat? And when do we really breed her? And so essentially this is giving us an optimal time to breed those cows or heifers. Yes, we still have a large breeding window. We always did before as well. But before we really didn't know or really couldn't key in on exactly when she was in heat. Yeah, I can go out there and see that she's in heat. But did she come in and heat in the middle of the night? Was it a short heat? What, what's really going on? So the system is, estimating when she is going to ovulate to give us an ideal or a more optimal time to breed her. And it's doing all that through those algorithms and monitoring the key pieces of rumination, activity, and eating uh, to help give us this breeding window. And so kind of going to wrap it up here and there's a lot on this one screen. So I'm, I'm not going to hit on everything here, but this is coming out of uh, some studies from SDSU. I've got a top piece here and then there's a bottom half, but this top piece, the numbers that I really want to key in on are estrus detection. So we can look at estrus detection. Um, like I used to go out and heat check my cows. I'd do it in the morning, I'd do it in the evening. And a lot of times that's about all I really knew. Um, yeah, I was still using patches and I still do now as an aid, but I'm still just heat detecting them twice a day. So through this study, twice a day, um, estrus detecting, heat detecting, uh, it showed a 50%, 56% uh, heat detection, estrus detection. With the system, uh, 24 hours a day heat detection, uh, we're looking at 95% estrus detection. So I can bring those numbers down the chart here on the left, the 55% estrus detection equal to 39% pregnancy rate. Over on the right, looking at the same, the same direction, if we go from 95% estrus detection, that equaled in this study a 67% pregnancy. And so really in my mind, it just comes down to how often are we observing estrus? Do we have time to do it twice a day? Do we have time to do it 24 hours a day? I know I'm not out heat checking my heifers or cows in the middle of the night. Uh, so some of those tricky ones that um, you know the system can help um, help you out with, um, and then there's some of those heifers and cows that are what I call short heats. We've got long heats. We've got all kinds of different things going on, uh, but the system is 24 hours a day monitoring estrus and health and using all those algorithms together to help monitor. And the other important piece on the bottom here that they use in one of these studies. Um, on 500 head is really the timing of uh, when cows are coming into heat. Uh, I guess I can't really tell you when my cows normally come into heat. They, you know, before they came into heat when I saw them. And so in this study, what it was really showing you was a, a real good mix throughout 20 hours when those cows are coming into heat. You know, when I would heat check, it's basically from 6 a.m. to noon, there's 26%. And then I would probably come back in the evening when I'm doing chores, there's another 27%. So a small window of those cows you are actually seeing in estrus. 
but it's those tricky ones that are in the middle of the night or when you're not there at home or doing other activities, fixing fence, whatever that might be. Uh, the system is heat detecting 24 hours to, a day to, to help you with labor, to help you really know what's going on with um, that section of heifers and cows to really um, be able to manage them, whether that's through a sink protocol, um, managing labor, whatever that is. Um, and so really the benefits and value of a system like this, uh, this is just one piece of what AllFlex does, uh, but through this small piece, it's really uh, monitoring and advancing your reproduction uh, for your herd. It's monitoring health. Um, there's distress alerts if we have some issues, whether that's you know, a healthy cow is ruminating. If we have a cow that all of a sudden is not ruminating, uh, she's probably in distress and the system will alert you 24 hours a day. Um, it'll do that through your phone, through your email, whatever it might be, however you want to see that. Um, so it'll alert uh, those health issues as well. And again, we can re reduce some of those labor uh, costs and those fixed costs and those hormone costs, running them through the chute. We can just change up some of those protocols if it is an option for you as a producer. Um, but th those are just some of the benefits and values that a, uh, a system like this can bring back to you as a producer. And so really, that's all I wanted to, hopefully I got through that fairly br br briefly before you all left me to go to lunch here, but uh, there's my contact info. Uh, we have an updated um, website now uh, to look at some more data that we've populated on there, but appreciate you guys for having me. And if there's questions, uh, please throw them at me. Awesome, thank you so much, Clay. Um, like you said, we are running up against our break. So I'm gonna have you also monitor that Q&A box. So if people wanna throw some questions in there as well. I know this is one of the newer fronts of technology in our industry and it's something that has holds great, great potential as you mentioned there in the values and benefits of this program. Um, but if you don't mind to monitor that Q&A box as well to make sure if any questions come through, you get those answered. Perfect. And with that being said, I am going to give you a chance to at least get up and walk away from your computers for a few minutes. Um, so let's plan on being back here at 12.05 and then we will dive right into Dr. Drunowski's presentations. Thank you all so much for uh, being with us and sticking in there. Uh, once again, 12.05, uh, you've got 10 minutes to get up, run around, grab a snack. Thank you all. <laughs>